Blood Rules Blood Immortal Series Book 2 by Ava Benton Prologue Years ago, more like centuries and centuries ago, there a new strain of vampires was brought to creation. Night Wardens, they were called by those who knew of their existence. A Night Warden's mission was simple. Guard the high sorceress he was assigned to until needed no longer, then return back to his place deep within the earth, a place called the Fold. A new high sorceress would come to power every so often among the covens. Some covens were fortunate enough to have night wardens to keep them safe. These night wardens were bodyguards in essence, except they were bodyguards without a choice. Bound by the blood of the one they were charged with protecting, the night wardens were faithful, monastic, and unemotional. Or so it was thought. No one counted on the emotions that would arise in these creatures that walk the dark and protect the sorceresses that wield power. Chapter 1 Constantine After decades, I was still sure I'd never get used to Marissa's moods. Marissa, my charge, the one I served as a night warden. Fancy word for bodyguard. Except unlike most bodyguards, I was a mortal. And a vampire. Not that she was the moodiest witch I had ever guarded. Not even close. That had been Penelope. With Penelope, there had been a period of time when I expected to hear the shattering of glass or porcelain at least once a day. I used to thank my lucky stars that my reflexes were so sharp, or else I would have gotten hit right upside the head more than once. But Penelope had been a hot-headed witch, which was why the High Council decided to remove her from her position as early as they had. And a good decision it was, too. Just because a witch possessed exceptional powers didn't mean she was fit to lead a coven. Naturally, her early retirement had meant an early return to the fold for me, but it was still a better option than risking serious injury every day. So I chilled in the fold, in a state of stasis, while my body purged every trace of Penelope from my body. The usual time it took was typically not more than a century. But back to Marissa. She was a leader. Nobody could ever question that. She had the judgment for it. She didn't take things personally, which was extremely important. She never flew into fits of rage. She always took the time to think a problem out before coming up with a solution. Sometimes, she reminded me of a general on a battlefield instead of a high sorceress. That was likely why she had been high sorceress of the coven for many decades, a long stretch for almost any witch. Still, she could be moody. Deeply moody. Those were the times I made myself scarce in my room until she called on me for service. Not that I was hiding, I reminded myself as I did push-ups until my shoulders burned from the effort. I was working out, making sure to keep in shape so I could be on my toes if a threat ever presented itself. Not that there were any of those on the horizon but there was never a way of knowing for sure. No one from the Crescent Moon Coven had expected a threat, but it had presented itself nonetheless in the form of Kristoff. I made it my business to keep out of Marissa's private affairs, but it paid to keep an ear to the ground and stay abreast of current events. I knew that was where Marissa's anxiety stemmed from, the Crescent Moon incident. Knowing that another high sorceress had been kidnapped, her own niece no less, though they didn't have much of a relationship. From what I had overheard, the High Sorceress, Vanessa was her name, had returned to her coven, but her sister died in the fight to save her. Another of Marissa's nieces. I attributed Marissa's testy attitude to this as I rolled onto my back and proceeded with crunches. I wasn't working toward defining my body. Vampires tended to look good no matter what we did, thanks to the nature of what we were but rather toward keeping myself in fighting shape. Besides, I needed something to do. Life as a night warden wasn't exactly an exciting one unless there was some sort of war going on or tension with the human world. I remembered the height of that tension during the witch hunts in the 17th century, and sometimes I even wished for it back. Not that I would gladly go back to a world without modern conveniences. It was a very foul time in a lot of ways, and the fact that my senses were sharper than a human's only made it worse. 
the dawn of better hygiene and sewage systems had made life more bearable. Those weren't the only problems I wouldn't miss. The old superstitions had faded away, pushed back into history where they belonged. There was a time when a woman with a strange birthmark was considered one of Satan's mistresses. Or a woman who wanted to learn the mysteries of science that in the 21st century were considered everyday knowledge. Not to mention the fact that real, actual witches were in danger every time they so much as stepped foot out of their home back then. Even though human advancements were a positive thing, I missed the excitement of those days. That was living. That was real day-to-day -day type action which kept me on my toes. What was there in the modern era? Accompanying Marissa to meetings of the Cascade Circle Coven. Hearing stories dedicated to the many witches who had perished in the early 1900s, thanks to the sorcerer who was responsible for recently causing trouble at Crescent Moon. Marissa remembered those terrifying days, but I didn't. I was in the fold then, sleeping off my most recent round of service. When she spoke of those times, she always used a hushed voice. Like she was talking about the ancient goddesses she and her coven sisters paid tribute to. That was it for me. I stood by and waited for things to happen, instead of feeling as though I had a purpose. I supposed I should feel grateful there wasn't anything urgent that needed my attention. There were always sorcerers in the world, and there would never be warm feelings between them and witches, at least not the witches I had known throughout my centuries of service. There could be witches who used their powers to control others, I supposed, the way sorcerers did. They coveted the powers of the supremely powerful witches protected by night wardens like me, and couldn't understand why a high sorceress would use those powers for good. But Kristoff was dead, and he was easily the most evil of all sorcerers known to either coven. Even so, Kristoff had lain in wait for a century before inflicting more pain. There could be another out there like him, also waiting. This thought drove Marissa insane with anxiety. I could sense it as surely as I could feel the floor beneath my back when I finished my crunches. She knocked at the door to my room, not long after I finished. Sometimes I wondered if she could read my thoughts. Yes. I called out. I would like to visit my daughter before we go out for the meeting. At least she didn't order me around. I had dealt with that in the past too. Marissa always informed, never demanded. All right. I'll take a shower and be right with you. I just finished working out. I rose and opened the door so she could see the sweat rolling down my chest. She raised a sardonic eyebrow before turning and walking away. By all means. She wasn't one to mince words. I like that about her. I was never a master of conversation. I thought back to one of my earlier charges, Francesca, and what a talker she was. Back in those days, we used to say a person's tongue was hinged in the middle when they chattered incessantly. Francesca certainly was. Sometimes I could still hear her prattling on and on in my mind, talking to fill the silence between us. I never could get her to understand that I preferred silence. I sought it out, in fact. She wanted to visit her daughter, Monica. I wondered vaguely when things had thawed out between them. Marissa had nearly thrown the fit to end all fits when her daughter had announced she was taking time to visit Europe. Monica had been ill for no reason any doctor could discover and had believed the change would be good for her. Of course, this was all around the time Kristoff was terrorizing her cousins, so Marissa wanted none of it. But Monica had gotten her way. As far as I knew from the whispers overheard at the tedious coven meetings, they hadn't spoken since. For maybe five weeks had passed since then. I could never be accused of liking a witch. I tolerated them at most. But Monica was one of the better ones I had ever known. She was very young when I went into service for her mother, and had since grown into a capable witch who some believed would take her mother's place one day. It often happened that way. The things a night warden learned while listening to side gossip during meetings. I had to do something, or else I'd lose my mind from sheer boredom. I'd been watching their meetings for more years than I could remember, once every month at least. 
A witch's powers were at their most potent during a full moon. Even I could sense it when I fed on Marissa at those times. Her blood was sweeter and hotter, and even more irresistible then. I always came out of a feeding with a feeling of headiness, almost a high. A dangerous feeling. Addictive, even. Just thinking about her blood made me thirst for it, and when I caught sight of myself in the bathroom mirror, I saw that my eyes had gone from green to nearly rust red. My fangs extended, long and bright white shining, waiting to be used. The lust was overtaking me. I gripped the porcelain sink with both hands and growled, then looked down to see my claws leaving deep gouges in the surface. The sound echoed through the small room, bouncing off the tile walls and floor. Constantine, are you all right? Marissa called out, her hearing was almost supernatural. Thirsty, I managed to rasp, closing my eyes and willing the feeling to pass. I hadn't experienced that sort of all-encompassing lust out of nowhere since I was a young vampire, freshly turned. Hundreds and hundreds of years prior. It seemed like it was happening more often lately, too. I would have been able to think about it more clearly if I wasn't on the verge of a rampage. All I could think speak here smell was blood. I licked my parched lips and shook with need. Marissa banged on the door. I have some. Open up. Quickly. I lunged for the knob and turned it, gripping it as hard as I could to keep myself from tearing into her and taking the precious blood I needed so badly. For a split second, I saw myself crushing her body to mine, sinking my fangs into her throat to open her artery and drinking until she stopped moving, draining her completely and tossing her lifeless body aside so I could get more. More. I could hardly see, my vision blurred then clouded. I barely made out the shape of the vial she thrust toward me, but I could sense it. I could smell it. She had already pulled the stopper for me, so I tipped the vial back and poured the blood straight down my throat. It was heaven. As close to heaven as a creature like me could ever get, at any rate. Like explosions of pleasure rippling through me from head to toe. I could breathe again. I could think again. The lust eased from an all-encompassing, searing panic until it was nothing but a dull roar in the back of my mind. I leaned against the sink, breathing deep. A quick run of my tongue across my teeth told me the fangs had retracted. Thank you. I don't know how it came over me so fast. I haven't experienced anything like that in hundreds of years, the way it came on so quickly. She nodded. I noticed the way she stood in the doorway instead of coming into the room. She was ready to do what she needed to subdue me if I tried to attack. Or to flee. Do you feel ill? I don't think it's possible for me to feel ill per se, I informed her as I tightened the towel around my waist. I'm better now. Thank you. Do you need another vial? I shook my head. No, this will do. I tossed the drained vial into the wastebasket, before going to my room to dress. My head still spun, but much less than before. I could think clearly again. Even so, I had to sit on the edge of my bed for a moment once I was alone. What was happening to me? I had never heard of a night warden losing control, having to go back to the fold early. It was unthinkable. Was there a time limit to our service? None I was aware of. I wouldn't even know who to ask. I had no friends, no way to contact anyone of my kind. I didn't even know which of my brethren had been selected to replace the dead Night Warden from Crescent Moon, and if I did, I wouldn't know how to reach him. What would I say if I did? I think there's something terribly wrong with me. I can't control my bloodlust anymore. I think I'm becoming the monster humans believe we are. For once, I wished we weren't such a secret among others like us. Our secrecy had always been our strength. Only the witches of the covens we served knew of us. And the sorcerers. For the first time, I wondered if a sorcerer's spell was to blame. But why? To get to Marissa. I was making excuses. The problem was me. If I couldn't perform my night warden duties without fear of bloodlust paralyzing me at any moment, 
I would have to step down. Chapter 2 Constantine Marissa's home sat along the shoreline in Greenwich. She preferred the peace and quiet, she said, not to mention the fact that her neighbors left her alone. The fact that they never questioned her agelessness didn't surprise me. Witches had a way of lulling humans into overlooking the obvious, not that humans were that observant to begin with. The smell of sea air braced me as we walked down the wide wood plank steps leading from the front porch to the driveway. I did enjoy the view of the water, even if the town was a tourist nightmare throughout the summer. It was still February, however, so everything was quiet and still. I didn't have to block out the sound of hundreds of overlapping voices or the smell of human blood. I swallowed hard at the thought and reminded myself that I had just fed. Perhaps I should have accepted the second vial when Marissa offered. I hadn't fed directly from her in years, ever since her daughter walked in on us and gasped in horror at the sight of me sucking blood from her mother's wrist. Monica knew what our relationship entailed and had been an adult at the time, but it was still a shock. In my saner moments, I could understand why. It would be like walking in on a parent having sex. Only sex was less likely to kill a participant if it went too far. Marissa had started draining her blood into glass vials and storing several at a time for me immediately after that. I never enjoyed the feeling of you draining me, she had explained at the time with a careless wave of her hand. If I could feel feelings, I would have been hurt by that. It wasn't as if I enjoyed being forced to feed from her and no one else. No night warden celebrated his fate. I would have much rather been free to hunt as I used to, in the dense forest of my Serbian home, many hundreds of years earlier. Living the way a vampire was supposed to, not as some caged prisoner. Though my cage was a gilded one, Greenwich was hardly a cesspool, and Marissa's farmhouse was more like a mansion, it was a cage nonetheless. I had held my tongue then, as always, even though half the point of feeding was the experience of latching onto a throat or a wrist and sucking the blood, swallowing mouthful after mouthful, knowing the witch's heart was beating the exquisite fluid into me. There was something more to it as well, a feeling of connection. Connection was one thing I missed from my old life, years ago when I was nothing more than a hunter. Feeling as though I were part of something, touching a warm body or kissing warm soft lips and knowing the other person was there in the moment with me. I had never felt anything like it since then, except when drinking the blood of another. And now even that had been taken from me. I kept to myself throughout the ride to Monica's home, though that was nothing new. I generally stayed quiet unless called upon to speak. I had nothing to say for one thing. Even if I did, offering my opinion without being axed or making small talk was frowned upon. I wasn't there for conversation or to make friends. I was there because my sire had decided to kill the daughter of a high sorceress hundreds of years earlier. It only bothered me at certain times, and I was already in a dark mood thanks to the self-doubt swirling around in my head. I rarely doubted myself, so this was new. I shifted in my seat, perturbed to the point of physical discomfort. She noticed. Are you feeling all right? That solicitous tone. I told myself she was sincere, if only to keep from yelling at her. I'm fine. Thank you. I do feel better now. I brought the extra vial, just in case you need it. The way she said it, one would think she was talking to a toddler. I bit back my distaste and said, thank you. That's very thoughtful. I only want you to be well. Do you think you need some rest? Her normally smooth forehead creased with worry. I can't imagine resting. I don't think I've rested outside the fold in the last five centuries, I shrugged, then looked back out the window. The conversation was making me distinctly uncomfortable, though I couldn't put my finger on exactly why. She was digging. For what? It's just that I know it's rare for a night warden to be on duty for as long as you have, she pressed. I'm starting to wonder if I haven't, I don't know, worn out my welcome. Overused you. Overused me, I snorted bitterly. I don't mean to offend you. You're not offending me in the least, 
I answered in a flat, dull voice. It was the answer that was expected of me, though that didn't make it any less true. I was amused more than anything else at the way this powerful, talented witch backpedaled. But I don't know the rules, you see, she continued. I don't even know if there are rules when it comes to this. Perhaps I should step down entirely, allow us both to get the rest we need. That caught my attention. I wasn't sure I was ready to go back to the fold yet. I enjoyed the era I was in. Though I didn't have much reason to use current technology, the fact that it existed fascinated me. I enjoyed reading about it throughout the long sleepless nights natural to all vampires. I enjoyed watching movies on television, just about any type of movie I could ever want to see. The ones depicting times in which I had lived fascinated me the most. They were almost always laughably wrong, but what else could I expect from humans who had never known real life back then? Going back to the fold. I didn't mind the idea of peace, quiet, and a long sleep. But that was roughly the only aspect I would enjoy. Waking up in another hundred years would mean starting from scratch, learning everything I'd had to catch up on in the last few decades, which was a lot. A hell of a lot. And life had only picked up speed since then. I would be hopelessly behind if there even was a world left in a hundred years. It's entirely up to you and your coven, I reminded her. My counsel, you mean? I would have to run any plans past them for approval. I don't get to make many of my own decisions, much like you. She offered a weak smile. I turned away again. She might not have offended me before, but I was closer than ever. The fact that she thought we were in any way alike was beyond me. I was little more than a slave, forced to pay for a crime I didn't commit. Living with the weight of my brethren on my shoulders. If I refused to serve, my sire would die, and so would the rest of us because we were bonded to him. It was something I had reminded myself of throughout Penelope's fits of violence, throughout Francesca's endless monologues, throughout all the little indignities I had faced over time. It was the only thing that kept me from wreaking bloody, satisfying havoc more than once. She thought we were the same because she had to serve her coven's best interests, all because she was special and had been chosen to lead them. A good thing my heart can't break for her, I thought with a grimace. Regardless, I don't have much of a say in the matter. I'll follow your lead. I put as much emphasis on my words as I could, ending the conversation. It was a pointless one. She helped nothing with her attempts at making it look as though I had a choice. It was almost cruelty, though I knew she would never see it that way. She thought she was doing me a service. Arriving at Monica's was a relief. Now Marissa could irritate someone else for a while. I climbed from the car before she did, looking both ways to ensure we were alone and safe before opening her door. She unfolded her tall, curvaceous body and gave me a tentative smile. I hope she doesn't mind our dropping in like this. I clenched my teeth together to keep my jaw from falling open. She's not expecting us. Not exactly. I wanted to tell her there was no such thing as not exactly in a situation like we were in. Either Monica expected us or she didn't. It was mothers like Marissa who made me glad I didn't have one of my own. There was already a car in the driveway, we had parked behind it, so the odds of her being home were good. I wish they weren't. I was in no mood to stand around feeling foolish, because Marissa didn't know when to leave well enough alone. I walked up the steps to the little Cape Cod-style house, and stood with hands clasped behind my back as my charge rang the bell. Footsteps. They came closer down the stairs. They stopped. I could almost sense Monica's panic, and the way she couldn't decide whether to pretend she didn't hear the bell. Too late. Monica. I didn't mean to disturb, but I haven't seen you in so long, and I wanted to catch up before the meeting. I glanced around, wondering what to duck behind if they got into a fight. I had experienced many things in my long life, but a fight between two witches was still something I had managed to avoid. Even when I guarded Penelope. 
The floorboards creaked again as Monica approached with caution. I could see her through the window in the center of the door, through the lace curtain. Halfway down the stairs, she completed her descent and opened the door enough that we could see her face. Her hair was wet, dripping on the floor. This is a surprise, she managed to laugh, uncomfortable. I would have taken a shower earlier if I had known you were planning on stopping by. I averted my eyes, even though she was wearing a tightly belted robe. There was something so fragile about her at this moment. I couldn't even explain it to myself. Surprised and dripping wet and completely at a loss. Well, come in, come in. She stepped back and opened the door wider so we could step inside. I looked down at the floor, up at the ceiling, anywhere but at her. I had never felt so uncomfortable around her, or, frankly, any witch. Only the ones whose blood I drank had ever warranted consideration before. She was no different than any other witch, even if she was Marissa's daughter. It wasn't like I knew her. We had never spent much time together without her mother nearby. Even so, I felt the need to apologize for our rude arrival. When did you get back? Marissa acts, making herself at home in an overstuffed easy chair, spreading her long flowy skirt over the seat. Monica tucked her hair, normally brown flecked with auburn but nearly black thanks to being wet, behind her ears. A nervous gesture. Three days ago. No. Four. Four days. Marissa raised an eyebrow. And not a word to your mother. Mother. Come on. She glanced at me. I'll wait in the kitchen, I murmured. Marissa waved a dismissive hand. No need. It doesn't matter whether you hear this or not. Mother, please. Monica winced, then shrugged apologetically. I'll wait in there anyway. It was either that, or indirectly kill my entire vampire family by killing her. I turned with my fists clenched tight by my sides and stalked into the kitchen, where I took a seat at the table and waited. The way I always waited. Chapter 3 Monica. What is wrong with you? I hissed when he was out of the room. I knew it was pointless. He could hear me with his super hearing, or whatever it was. Constantine was a closed book, but I had the feeling he knew a lot more than he ever let on. He saw a lot. He heard a lot. What? My mother snapped in a tight whisper. You've never treated him like that before. Did I miss something while I was away? I sat on the ottoman, in front of the chair my mother sat on. She dressed the way modern witches were expected to dress, the flowy clothes, the colorful scarf around her throat, silver bangles on her wrists. Like a sideshow fortune teller. All she needed was to move the scarf to her head and add a crystal ball. She shrugged. No. Nothing. Everything on this side of the Atlantic has been status quo. Her voice was icy. She wasn't going to let me get away with leaving town. There I was, thinking she might thaw out a little if I stayed away long enough. When would I learn? Have you heard anything from Aunt Cressida? She shook her head, frowning. I would think at a time like this, my sister would reach out to me. I mean if not now, when? You should have made the first move, I mused. Me? She pointed to herself. You knew when Vanessa was kidnapped that she would be a wreck. You could have offered support. And now with Maria gone. I shook my head and wished, not for the first time, that I had been closer with my cousins. But neither of our mothers would allow it because of some stupid ancient fight that had nothing to do with us. How pointless. I never had sisters of my own. They were the closest I would ever get. She hasn't spoken to me in over a century, Monica. You don't know what you're talking about, though I know you mean well. I doubt that I even crossed her mind through the whole nightmare. I wasn't so sure, but if that was what she needed to tell herself. There isn't a problem between you and Constantine, then? I asked, chewing my lip. No. I told you. Everything's just fine. It's not like you to just, I don't know, dismiss him that way. She avoided my eyes. 
I sighed. Do me a favor, and never go to Atlantic City unless you plan to lose a lot of money. What's that mean? It means you've always had a tell. Whenever you're lying, or conveniently avoiding the truth, you look away. She rolled her eyes. I've missed you these last months. No one else acts like they're my mother. I chuckled and patted her hand. I've known you too long. What is it then? She opened her mouth to speak, then closed it. I, I don't know. I think there's something wrong with him. She mouthed that last part so he wouldn't hear. I didn't want to spend the rest of the conversation mouthing things to each other, so I cast a ward around the kitchen that would muffle any sound coming from elsewhere in the house. There. Now we have a little privacy. What's wrong with him? He's flying into these bloodlust rages out of nowhere. I don't trust him in public anymore. Perhaps it's been too long that he's been outside the fold. Perhaps my blood isn't enough for him anymore. I'm not sure. But I feel as though I might be putting myself or others in danger by keeping him in my service. Oh come on. He's always been well in control of himself before. Which is why this is so surprising. Monica, I thought he would kill me just before we left. One minute, everything was fine. The next, he was gouging the bathroom sink with those claws of his and baring his fangs at me. I was terrified. I've never seen him that way before. I swear to you, I thought he would attack me. I think he wanted to. Her announcement knocked the wind out of me. This is very serious. You have to talk to somebody about this. My heart was heavy, but that didn't change anything. Constantine was practically part of the family, if family meant hardly ever speaking to someone and not even knowing their last name. For that matter, I didn't know if he had a last name. I'm sure I should. I'm not certain how to approach it though. We'll think of something. I'm glad I came home when I did. Not Constantine. It didn't seem possible. He and my mother were practically attached at the hip. Well? What about Europe? Her face brightened. I'll never forget visiting there when I was your age. It was such a special trip. This was pretty special too, I smiled. I feel so much better than I did before I left. It really did the trick, I think. I might move there permanently. I didn't mean it, of course. I would never leave my coven but it was fun to get under her skin. Her eyes flew open wide, like I had just threatened to renounce my powers. You wouldn't. I tried to keep a straight face, but it was impossible when I got a reaction like that. No. I wouldn't. Come on. You know me better than that. Don't even joke. My only daughter, leaving permanently. She shook her head, making her silver earrings jingle. Especially since you know the council will likely replace me with you when the time comes. That again. I changed the subject before she could go any further. Anyway, I brought you back some presents. I even brought something back for Constantine. For Constantine? Her eyebrows went up. I stopped off in Serbia before flying back. I thought he might like something from his homeland, I said with a shrug. It was the least I could do. He's always been good to you and done his job, right? That's true. But she didn't sound like she approved. I'll go upstairs and get them. Was she right about him? I hoped not and not just for her sake. I had no idea how his world worked or what they would do to him if he got sent back to the fold ahead of time. I didn't even know who they were. But there had to be a they. Somebody had to be in charge. I took a look at myself in the mirror above my dresser while I pulled the gifts from my suitcase, the only one I hadn't unpacked yet. It had been almost empty when I left for Europe, since I knew I'd need space for anything I bought over there. Sometimes I wished it were true that witches traveled by broomstick. It would have saved me a ton in baggage fees. I giggled softly to myself, where would I store my luggage on a broomstick? When I saw myself, I noticed that my cheeks were flushed. I was smiling. My good mood couldn't have come from my mother's visit, even though it was a relief that she was speaking to me again. 
A pain in the ass or not, she was still my mother. At least I looked better than I had before I left for Europe. I was afraid somebody would mistake me as an extra from The Walking Dead when I boarded the plane. I had needed the rest. No more than that. It was more than fatigue that had sent me overseas. Nobody would ever know the pain I had been through in the weeks leading up to the trip, not physical pain, but something much worse. I could have dealt with physical pain, maybe even enchanted it away. Night after sleepless night spent worrying, certain that my life was slipping away was another story. It was agony, not knowing what was wrong, not knowing how to stop it. Feeling so weak I couldn't get out of bed sometimes. Falling asleep for no reason, out of nowhere. My pale skin, the circles under my eyes, the lack of enthusiasm for anything, including living. Part of me had expected to die in Paris or Rome, peacefully, away from my mother's drama and the questions and prying eyes of the coven. Maybe while looking out over the Seine, or while admiring the Trevi Fountain or Spanish Steps. My mother wasn't the only one with the flair for drama, I supposed. Only I hadn't died. I had gotten better, stronger, happier in less than two weeks. My appetite had come back with a roar, and I had eaten my way from Naples to Rome to Sicily. I had tanned on the Riviera and eaten more butter than I thought was possible in Paris, smeared on fresh baked bread so good it had brought tears to my eyes, then washed it down with the richest wine imaginable. I had visited Greece and admired the quiet beauty of its coastal villages, making friends with the locals, learning about the world as they saw it. I had tasted life. I had soaked it in. No wonder I looked so happy and healthy again. I jogged downstairs with an armload of gifts and set them on the coffee table. My mother ooed over the purse, the hat, the scarves, the perfume. I wish I could have brought back some of the food. The cheese. I closed my eyes and could almost taste it. You didn't put on any weight, she noticed. I bit my tongue, before I could snap at her for even mentioning it. I was underweight when I left, and I walked until my blisters had blisters. I held up a printed caftan, and she clapped her hands like a happy child. Oh, I almost forgot. With a wave of my hand, the ward on the kitchen dissolved. Constantine? I have something here for you. For me? He was frowning as he entered the living room, ducking under the doorway. Even so, his dark chocolate-colored hair brushed the doorframe. Green eyes squinted almost warily as he approached. I hope you don't mind. My last stop was in Serbia. His expression softened. Serbia. The word was heavy with meaning, and my heart went out to him. What would it be like, forced to leave my homeland and spend hundreds of years someplace else? With no chance of ever going back? I held out the small sword I had bought for him. It wasn't cheap, though I was pretty sure the man who'd sold it to me from a cart outside a crumbling old church had given me a steep discount anyway. It's believed to date back to the siege of Belgrade, or so the man told me, I said. A Serbian weapon used to defend the city against the Ottoman invasion. It's beautiful, he murmured as he took it from me. And it was. It had immediately caught my eye when I first saw it. The wooden handle was clearly hand-carved and dated back hundreds of years, judging from the way time and touch and smoothed it down. But the blade was heavy and sharp. The man I obtained it from proved the quality of the blade, I said, remembering my surprise. I was wearing a thin scarf. He asked me to hand it to him. When I held it out with the ends dangling down, he sliced them off. My mother gasped. He did? I made him take the cost of the scarf off his asking price, I grinned. It didn't matter. What mattered was how pleased Constantine looked. I don't know why I thought of you when I saw it. Maybe because you've always protected my mother. Not that you've ever needed a sword to do that, I chuckled. Good thing too. He might have used it on her. I knew she had taken me to that point many times and could only imagine she had done it to him, too. He looked at me, and did something I had never seen him do before. He smiled and it lit up his face. I had never really looked at him before then, I realized. Sure I knew what he looked like, and had once or twice commented to myself on how handsome he was. 
it was always in an off-handed way, like an afterthought. But he had never smiled. When he did, I wondered how I had missed him for so long. This is very thoughtful. Thank you. You're welcome. I turned away and made a big fuss over straightening up my mother's gifts. Anything to keep him from seeing the way I blushed. I should go up and get ready for the meeting, or we'll be late. Chapter 4 Constantine I sat beside the driver with the sword in my lap, wrapped in layers of fabric to protect it. She would never know how much it meant, and it would have sounded stupid if I tried to tell her. Stupid and pointless, since she cared as little about my life as I cared about hers. She would likely shift uncomfortably and avert her eyes if I tried to explain what having that sword did for me. I didn't ask for an explanation, she would think, looking for a way to escape the conversation. She couldn't know that my father had fought in the siege of Belgrade. He and roughly 60,000 other citizens had joined with the army to hold back the invading Ottomans. And they had won. It was before I was born, but that didn't mean the picture he'd painted for me in story after story of that epic, nearly three-week battle had lost any of its clarity or significance. There were times when, sitting on his knee by the fire after a long day of hunting and trapping, I would add in the details he had skipped that night. We would tell the stories, together. They became ours, and remained so even after I was too big for his knee, and was doing the hunting and trapping along with him. She couldn't know that. But somehow, some way, she had come across a relic from that time and had chosen it for me. Like the past was trying to tap me on the shoulder, remind me that I had once been human and had loved and laughed. Until the night I went out hunting alone. The night I became the prey. I clenched my jaw and willed myself not to think about that night, that or anything else which came after it. Knowing I could never see my family again that I was a monster, unfit to be around my mother and father and sisters. They were good, hard-working, God-fearing. It was better they thought I was dead, for at least they would love my memory. Finally giving in one day, months later, telling myself it wouldn't hurt to watch them from afar as they took their evening meal. Stop this. No good will come of it. I shook my head, willing the memories away. The screams. The blood. I looked down at the sword, invisible in its wrapping. Somehow, she knew what it meant for me to have it. If anybody were to ask, she would shrug and say it was a random purchase. There was no significance. And she'd be telling the truth, as far as she knew it. It was well past dark by the time we arrived at the meeting place, the same location the coven had been holding its meetings since the days when witches arrived in a horse-drawn carriage instead of a luxury sports car. I decided to leave the sword in its wrappings, under the front seat, before opening the door for Marissa to exit the car. Her breath was a cloud in the cold, clear night as she looked up at the tall, unimpressive boxy building. It was dark inside, abandoned before it was ever completed. Many such buildings had existed on that land over the years. She had once explained to me the fact that multiple enchantments had been cast over the location back before the United States was a proper country. Nothing ever built on the land would be successful or even finished, because the land had been claimed by the original coven when they'd reached the New World. That wasn't exactly the sort of message they could print on a sign and hang on a fence, of course, so developer after developer had to try and fail to make it their own. Of course, no sleep was lost among the coven. One of the few things witches and vampires agreed on was the uselessness of humans and what they considered important. The latest incarnation was supposed to be a high-rise apartment building for young people with more money than cents. They would have to find an overpriced apartment somewhere else. I stayed a few steps behind the women as they walked through the front door, stepping around a stack of cinder blocks left behind by the construction crew before crossing the threshold. It was only after another few looks around to be sure we were undetected that I felt comfortable following them. Once inside, it was a very different world. Whatever the building's designer had envisioned faded into the background as Marissa's taste took over. 
The wide deep lobby featured a fire pit in the center, surrounded by cushions on which dozens of witches reclined while waiting for their high sorceress to arrive. Only it wasn't she all eyes turned to. Monica was the star of the night, and they all rushed over to greet her as she slipped deep crimson robes over her street clothes. Much better, thanks. Yes, it was incredible. Oh, I already can't wait to get back there. She looked embarrassed at the attention. It would be better for her to get used to it, since rumor had it she would follow her mother one day. That would be another night warden's problem. I would be enjoying a well-deserved rest at that point. The thought of the fold snapped me out of my gossip-fueled thoughts. I still felt steady. The beating of so many hearts, I could hear them all, every single one, overlapping, didn't send me into a frenzy. I remembered that Marissa had extra blood with her, just in case. Needing her as desperately as I did made me sick. Who was I becoming? I barely recognized myself anymore. We're all glad to have her back, Marissa agreed, her voice rising above the others. She didn't like sharing the spotlight. A fair leader, a smart one, but vain. I supposed all leaders, especially ones adored by those they led, developed an ego if left in power long enough. They took that as a cue to get the meeting started. I knew this part all too well, and stood back as they formed a circle around the fire. Marissa flicked her wrist, making the many candles around the room flicker to life, and the fire roar higher and hotter than before. It cast the cavernous room in a warm glow and made shadows dance on the walls. Sometimes I watched the shadows. It was more interesting than what the witches did. We thank you for the blessings you have showered on us, Marissa crooned, eyes closed. The others echoed her, raising their arms until their palms touched. I wondered what they thought it did, their words and chants and rituals. Not that I hadn't seen evidence of their power. Just the fact that humans couldn't see the abandoned building for what it really was showed me that much. None of them would step foot inside, thanks to whatever spells Marissa had cast once the developer and contractors gave up on the project. There was none of the graffiti or garbage which marked other abandoned buildings in the city. Homeless squatters wouldn't consider it. And that was the tip of the iceberg. Marissa and my other charges had performed feats of jaw-dropping significance before my eyes. Even so, they would probably have just as much power without the chanting and swaying and candles. It wasn't my place to voice an opinion, and I didn't feel like taking a lightning bolt to the ass for it. With that in mind, I suffered through every full moon, stifling my yawns and wishing I could be alone with my television. I wished it just then, maybe more than ever. I didn't feel the cold the way the witches did, of course, but even without that sensation, the bleak, cold foreboding pressed in on me wasn't something I could ignore. Didn't they feel it? A gust of cold air swirled around the room and blew out the candles all at once. The witches barely had time to react before the fire went out too. No ordinary breeze could do that. Nothing natural could, since the fire was controlled by magic. I darted to Marissa's side out of instinct, but I wasn't in time before her head snapped back, knocking the hood to her shoulders. Cries of panic and fear filled the room, but she stayed still and silent. Mother! Monica cried out. I stepped between them, obeying instinct again. Something told me not to touch her. You have what is mine. The voice was deep throaty, completely unlike Marissa's. It came from Marissa, but from the room as well, from thin air all around us. You shall pay the price. What? What do you mean, one of the witches acts? Speak. She didn't move. She didn't blink. You have what is mine. It shall be mine again. And you shall pay for thinking you could deceive me. A bitter laugh bubbled up in her throat, growing louder and louder, until it nearly deafened me. I covered my ears, we all did, just before it turned into a shriek of fury and Marissa's face twisted into a mask of rage. The fire flared up, bigger and stronger than before, and several witches fell back before their robes caught. The shriek faded. Marissa dropped to the floor like a puppet whose master had suddenly abandoned it. Mother! Monica pushed past me 
and fell to her knees beside her mother. Mother Mama, speak to me, please. Open your eyes. She held Marissa's head in her lap and patted her cheeks firmly, insistently. The witches crowded in on us, only to fall back when they caught sight of the fangs which extended over my lower lip, the claws I held up in preparation for attack. Stay back. I growled, and they did as I commanded. I scanned the room from where I stood, close to Marissa and Monica. I saw no one but the terrified witches in their hooded robes. The cold, dark presence I'd become aware of moments before the flames went out was gone. The sound of Marissa's groans drew my attention, and I fell to one knee beside her. Her eyes fluttered open. Oh, oh, I can't believe it, she whimpered. It was too terrible. She caught sight of my still-present fangs and shrank away from me. I calmed myself, and they retracted. First off, are you all right? Monica asked, stroking her mother's cheek, smoothing her hair back. If she noticed the fangs or claws, she didn't show it. I think so. But it was awful. Awful. She squeezed her eyes shut, shaking her head. You were aware of what you were saying. I asked. Um him. He was in my head, and I saw him. I felt him. Oh, it was something I never want to do again. But I had no control over it. Her hazel eyes darted back and forth, like she was looking for the presence. You saw him. I ax. This was beyond my experience. I could fight physical threats. I could sense the presence of darkness more easily than even witches could, which explained the sensation of foreboding just before Marissa's possession. There was nothing I could do when the threat was inside her and invisible to us. Yes. Inside my head. Not, not exactly a picture, but as close to one as I can imagine. She tried to sit up. Monica helped her. Marissa blinked hard. If I never experience that again, it will be too soon. Who is he? A random witch called out from behind me. I have no idea. I've never felt his presence before. Her chin quivered as she leaned against Monica's shoulder. I had never seen her so vulnerable. Between the pain written on her face and the flickering light from the relit fire, she seemed to age years in the blink of an eye. What is he looking for? Somebody else adds, as we helped Marissa settle down on a stack of cushions. I, I don't know, she sputtered, shaking her head. It's all such a confused mess. Once I have a little time to process, I might be able to understand what he was referring to. Whoever he is. Marissa was lying. From the look on Monica's face as she looked up at me, she knew it too. Chapter 5 Monica I waited until we were in the car to ask any further questions. I didn't want to put my mother on the spot, in front of the rest of them. They needed reassurance just then. They needed to know their high sorceress was all right, and things were as under control as they could be. I made sure to keep a confident smile on my face, and deliberately made eye contact with as many of my coven sisters as possible. Inside the car was another story. I leaned back with a sigh, rubbing my temples as my teeth chattered from the cold. My mother's driver had kept the heater running while we were inside, but I was still freezing. Or scared to death. My mother's face was a funny shade of gray. I had never seen a face that color before. Especially not hers. What happened back there? I murmured, watching her from the corner of my eye. I told you everything. There's not much more to say. Or do you want me to keep reliving it? She looked out the window, away from me. I knew you were lying. So did Constantine, I could tell. He didn't turn toward us, but his head cocked to the side in such a way that I knew he was listening. Neither of you were inside my head. You don't know. So tell us. I turned to her, took her hands. She still wouldn't look at me. Mother, this is serious. If we're going to figure out who did this and why, we have to know everything you know. I don't, I can't. It was really that bad for you. Constantine murmured from up front. 
yes? She sounded like she was on the verge of tears. I could have screamed at her, taken her face in my hands and screamed with my nose touching hers. It wasn't a damn game. It wasn't smart, wasting time the way she was. Mother? Damn it. I moved closer, though not as close as I wanted to. Listen to me. If there's someone out there who's powerful enough to possess you while the coven was circled together, as one, we need to take action. Now. There's got to be something you can remember that you didn't mention back there. An image, what he's looking for, what he looks like, who he is. Something. I could have shaken her until her head fell off when she didn't say anything right away. She only stared at the back of Constantine's seat, but the unfocused look of her eyes told me she didn't see anything in front of her. She was in her head. I looked at Constantine, who turned his head slightly to look back at me. He was useless in a situation like this, and he had to know it. I imagined it was tough for him. I felt useless too, so I could relate. He must have shown you something, I murmured softly, wondering how fine the line was between prompting her and pushing her. If I pushed too hard, she would shut down. Instead of answering, she sighed heavily. I wanted to keep you away from things like this. I've spent my life dedicated to two things, you and the coven. That's it. Your father knew I would never love him the way he needed, and I didn't even care when he left. I haven't even thought of him in 30, 40 years, except when you look at me a certain way or say something that reminds me of him. There just wasn't enough room in my heart for him. It wasn't his fault. I would feel the same way about any man. This has to do with my father? I ax more confused than ever. She shook her head. No. I don't know what made me think of him just now. Maybe because I can't stand the thought of losing you, ever. I love you too much. You're my world. What does any of this have to do with me? I ax, glancing at Constantine for a clue. He only frowned, listening hard. I wish you hadn't gone to Europe, she whispered. Her chin quivered but she tried to hold back the tears. What does Europe have to do with it? Mother, you need to try to be clearer. I know you've been through a shock. It has nothing to do with shock, she snapped. That was more like it. What does it have to do with? I snapped back at the end of my rope. He showed me what he wants. Whoever he is. He showed it to me, and it was as clear as you are to me right now. I could see it. I could have picked it up myself and held it, it was so clear. What was? Constantine asks. Where's that sword? She countered. The sword? I gasped. He wants the sword. So that's what it has to do with me. I felt like she had punched me in the stomach. Nothing could have prepared me for that. What's so special about the sword? Constantine asks. What does it matter? she countered. They went back and forth for a while, but I couldn't hear it over the rush of blood in my ears. I couldn't breathe, either. I was going to throw up. My palms went clammy. I felt dizzy. Monica. Constantine's voice was sharp, commanding, and it snapped me out of my daze. My mother touched my arm. Are you all right? I nodded. She was comforting me all of a sudden instead of the other way around. Funny how quickly things turned around. Fine. Just. I don't believe it. I don't understand it either. Where did you say you bought the sword? Constantine asks. From a peddler. Or, I thought he was a peddler. He was hawking little relics and touristy things in front of an old church in Belgrade. He waved me over, asked if I was interested in anything. I felt sorry for him. He wore rags, was thin and a little dirty, but he had a bright smile and seemed nice enough. I let out a bitter laugh. Typical, stupid American tourist. Roped in by any loser with a nice smile, who compliments her. Did he give you a name? Anything you could identify him with? I shook my head. I wish. I don't think I even asked for it. I mean, it didn't seem important. Do you ask the name of every person who sells you anything? 
He ignored the question. Did he say anything, anything at all, about the history of the sword? I concentrated as hard as I could. I was in the square, looking around, reading from a pamphlet with history and that sort of thing. And he waved me over and I was looking through his things, and I had just read about the siege. I closed my eyes. I'm sure he knew I was reading about it, which was why he told me the sword was from that time. It could be from any time. That doesn't matter, and it's obviously quite old, he added. Not to mention valuable, if a sorcerer wants to get it back, my mother fretted. I'm such a fool. I can't believe I let him rope me in that way, without asking where the sword came from. I should have axed. Of course, a valuable sword dating back as far as he claimed, wouldn't be on a peddler's cart without being stolen from some other place. I was so happy to find it, and I wasn't thinking clearly. When I looked back, it didn't make sense. I usually took my time before even the simplest purchase. I once read all 1400 reviews on a blender before ordering it. But I had picked up a sword that was obviously stolen without so much as a question. It's likely that it wouldn't matter if you could remember the peddler, Constantine muttered. I doubt he's alive at this point. Constantine, my mother hissed. He has to be dead if the sorcerer knew where to look for the sword. We have to be straightforward. We can't afford to lie to ourselves. He must have found the peddler and questioned him. So much for being straightforward, I thought with a sinking heart. Even he was trying to spare me. I'm dead. He's going to find me and kill me too. That's not true. Mother whispered, squeezing my hands. Monica, you can't talk that way. There are ways to protect you. What spells? Enchantments? I laughed bitterly as hot tears rolled down my cheeks. We already discussed how powerful he is, whoever he is. He possessed you. From half a world away maybe, while the coven was at its strongest. We weren't actively trying to keep another presence out, she insisted. Had we been, there's no way he could have gotten through to me. I wanted to believe but my heart was too heavy. I was too scared. I'm sorry, mother. I looked at Constantine. To you too. I gave you something that wasn't my right to give you. That doesn't matter, he muttered, shaking his head. I wish you hadn't, for your sake. That was the closest thing to tenderness I would ever get from him, I was sure. We reached my house first. Please come in with me. The thought of being in there alone scared me half to death. Do you think I would let you spend the night alone? My mother acts, already halfway out of the car. Only Constantine's sharp voice made her stop. We watched from inside the locked car while he swept the perimeter of the house, then as he went from room to room inside. He moved in a blur, like he was in fast forward while the rest of the world turned at its usual speed. Even as I watched in awe of his powers, I wondered at the point. It didn't matter if the sorcerer was hiding outside my house or not. If he could possess a high sorceress, he could do anything. Still, I felt better to have him with us as we walked inside. My mother sent the car away and told the driver she'd call when she was ready to be picked up. I wondered in the back of my mind how long it would be until she did. I'll make some tea. She had to do something to stay busy. I watched her go to the kitchen as I sat on the sofa, legs trembling. Where's the sword? I ax. I couldn't look at him when I did. I had never felt so ashamed. He placed the wrapped bundle on the coffee table. For what it's worth, I appreciate the gesture. I snorted. Thanks. I'll remember that when some stranger is murdering me. Don't even say that. My mother came in holding a tray with hot water and teacups. Here. Drink this. You'll feel better. Nothing will make me feel better, nothing in a teacup, I muttered. I got up rather than let her hang all over me. I couldn't stand it. Not when I had put her and the coven in danger with my stupidity. What would they think when they knew it was my fault? No wonder you didn't want to say anything to them about what you really saw, I muttered as I went to the window. Maybe I know something that will make you feel better, at least a little, she offered. 
I highly doubt it. Her voice was barely a whisper. What if I told you that you have protection? What a bodyguard. You're going to hire a bodyguard? I tried not to laugh and hurt her feelings. No. A night warden. I spun around, mouth hanging open. What did you just say? You have a night warden. She looked at Constantine. You. Chapter 6 Constantine I don't understand what you mean. A night warden. But. I'm not a high sorceress. Monica trailed off, obviously at a total loss. She wasn't alone in that. I had never heard anything that surprised me more. I looked from her to Marissa, silently asking the same questions Monica was. For her part, Marissa looked shamefaced. It was the only thing I could think to do. What did you think you could do? Monica prompted. Deep color rose up on her cheeks, bright red spots. I had to protect you, of course. Everything was so up in the air. There was no way of telling what would happen, whether Kristoff would come after you someday, or someone else. Her eyes pleaded with her daughter. And see. Someone does want to harm you. I did the right thing. My maternal instinct told me what to do, and I did it. What did you do, though? Monica nearly shouted. Her hands shook. Whether it was from fear or the effort to keep from throwing magic at her mother, I didn't know. She clasped them together, hard to make it stop. Instead of answering, Marissa looked at me and shrugged slightly. I'm sorry, but I couldn't tell you. It would get you into too much trouble. You did something to get him into trouble. Monica hissed. It sounded more threatening than when she shouted. Marissa nodded. It was all I could do. I had to find a way to keep you safe. If Kristoff or anyone else had tried to harm me, I could have accepted it. But not you. Never you. My sister almost lost both of her daughters. As it is, she has to face the rest of her life without one of them. How could I ever make that sort of sacrifice? I would rather sacrifice myself for your sake. What did you do, mother? Monica's voice was a weak whisper by then. I knew how she felt. The truth was closing in on me, and dread threatened to choke me. I had a sinking suspicion of what she did, and if I was right, it could mean the end of me. Marissa took a deep breath and squared her shoulders. A woman ready for battle. I used your blood to feed Constantine. The bomb dropped. I was afraid that was what she was going to say. My head spun. What did it mean for me? What if anybody found out? What would they do to me? Monica exploded. Are you insane? How did you even get my blood? Then, before Marissa could answer, she said, You. You're the reason I felt so tired and weak. You were taking my blood. How did you manage it? I would put you to sleep. Marissa looked at me. I'm sorry. It was the only way to keep her safe. I had to make sure she had a night warden. But I should have known the difference between your blood and hers. I've been drinking your blood for decades. There didn't seem to be a difference. There wouldn't be a major difference between her blood and mine. Any difference there was, I took care of with an enchantment. And you kept it fresh that way, I assume, Monica finished shaking her head. Mother, how could you do this? I understand you were worried, but this is borderline crazy. I've never heard anything like it. You stole my blood and gave it to Constantine. To help you, Marissa insisted, wringing her hands. I did it for you. You must see that. I don't have to see anything, Monica snarled. I don't think I've ever felt so disappointed in all my life. She turned away, arms folded over her midsection. I could feel the torment she was going through, and when I realized that I could, that it was her emotions I was connected to, the truth slammed into me. It was all true. Marissa had deceived me. I turned to her, and she stood. I did what I felt was right not only as a mother, but as high sorceress. What? Putting yourself in potential danger? 
possibly leaving the coven without its high sorceress. I axed, shaking my head. All the years we had spent together, and she had still managed to surprise me. Not that we had ever been close, but I had at least assumed that I could trust her. I should have known better than to assume anything good would ever come from a witch. She glowered at me, head held high. You're in no position to tell me what to do, Night Warden, she hissed. You're nothing but a servant. Perhaps I've been too easy on you all this time, too kind. Mother. Monica turned, mouth hanging open. This isn't like you. I mean every word, Marissa said, not backing down an inch. Not that I expected her to. She was a strong witch with a strong personality. I had a strong personality, too. And you wanted me to believe the problem was with me. Her blood wasn't enough after all the years I spent drinking yours, not with decades of imprinting between us. But your enchantment didn't help that, did it? You were clever, but you didn't think of everything. And yet, you wanted me to believe it was my fault. And you wanted me to believe it too, Monica said. She was still looking away from us, holding herself like she needed protection. Or comforting. You wanted him to go back to the fold, so nobody would ever know what you had done. And you were all right with me, thinking I was dying before I went to Europe. I honestly thought I was going to die, and the doctors just didn't know why yet. She barely choked back a sob. I did the right thing, Marissa maintained, head high. How she did that, not even apologizing for what she put us both through, I couldn't understand. You did a terrible thing, Monica whispered, shaking her head. Terrible. And it might still hurt Constantine in the end. You don't know what will happen to him because of this. Nobody needs to know. They will if I suddenly stop guarding you and start guarding your daughter, I reminded her. What would your counsel think about that? They don't need to know. But there was something in her tone that led me to believe she felt otherwise. She didn't sound as sure of herself anymore. Mother, they'll know. Monica held her head in her hands as she sank into a chair. They know everything. It's their job to know what we do. Then they'll understand. Marissa went to her, knelt at her side. They'll know about Kristoff and how terrible it was. They'll remember what it was like back then. You don't know. You weren't there when he... She choked back a whimper. He took my friends. My coven sisters. He brutally murdered them. How was I supposed to sit by and risk him doing that to you? Don't tell me I don't understand because I wasn't there. Monica muttered. Even when that's the case? Marissa whispered. They won't take pity on you, Monica predicted, raising her head to glare at her mother. And even if they do, they'll make an example out of him to warn others against pulling the sort of stunt you did. You don't know that. I do. And so do you. Monica looked up at me. I'm sorry for this. She was. I could feel it. How had I not noticed the shift from Marissa to her? Complacency. Stupidity. Or it could have been that Marissa's spell was just that powerful. I know, I muttered. We're wasting time talking about it, Marissa decided, standing with her hands on her hips. Imperious once again. We should be talking about a plan for you. Oh, mother. I mean it, she insisted. I have to put my foot down on this. You need to go into hiding until this is all worked out. Come on. I took something he says belongs to him. I'll give it back. It was an honest mistake. She glanced at me, then back at her mother. Neither of us said a word or even moved. Right. Monica acts, eyes darting back and forth. It's not as simple as that, Marissa murmured. I have to agree with her, I said. You can't plead ignorance and expect a sorcerer to forgive and forget. But it's the truth. If he found the peddler, he'll know it was all a mistake. I didn't purchase the sword knowing it belonged to anybody, especially not to a sorcerer. I had nothing but the best intentions. That won't matter. 
I've seen what sorcerers can do when their ire is up. Marissa wrung her hands. We'll have to work out a way to get the sword back to him, but I will not have you walking into this situation thinking it's something you can reason your way out of. It would be best for you to follow your mother's instructions now, I added. Every time I so much as looked at Marissa, my stomach turned. How stupid of me to think she was one of the better witches I had served. There was no such thing as a good witch. That was one thing I should have already known, but had forgotten along the way. Monica was no better. Stupid witch, buying something like that without asking herself where it came from and why a dirty roadside peddler would have it. Entitled witch, thinking an apology and claims of ignorance would help her. Like we'd have a happy ending if she said it was all a misunderstanding, because she was just that special. Her brows knitted together. I just think. It doesn't matter what you think. I exploded, and the two of them huddled together. Pride spread through me at the sight of their cowering. It had been too long since I felt like I had a degree of power. Forced to feed from vials instead of taking what I needed. Forced to stand in the background while stupid, vain, empty-headed women chanted and cast their little spells and made costly mistakes they needed others to fix for them. Having my life turned upside down without my knowing it, thanks to Marissa's little trick. Knowing what the penalty might be. I towered over them and relished their fear as I snarled, and when I raised my hands my claws cut the still air. Did that sorcerer ask about the circumstances behind you getting hold of his toy? No. Did he stop to find out whether it was all a misunderstanding? No. He promised to make you pay for what you did without knowing why or how you did it. That's reality, no matter how you want to twist it or wish it away. Your little spells and enchantments won't work either. You are powerless. You have no defense in this. You'll be lucky if he doesn't tear you limb from limb just for inconveniencing him. Stop this. Marissa pleaded, wrapping her arms around the trembling figure of her daughter. And you. I spat, leaning closer until I could smell the blood racing just under her skin. I curled my hands into fists, cutting into my palms instead of cutting her, fighting the urge to sink my fangs into her throat and drain her dry. If you think I won't throw you in front of your council and blame you for what you've done to me, you're insane. I'm going to make sure they know what their precious high sorceress did and how selfish and stupid and evil it was. I glared down at them. The only sound in the room was the sharp in and out of breath through my nose. My gaze traveled back and forth, watching, waiting for one of them to open their mouth and try to defend themselves. They didn't, because they couldn't. They only looked up at me with wide, terror-filled eyes. And that felt good. Better than it should have. The flash of rage cooled along with the desire to tear Marissa's throat out. When I could speak more calmly, I said, all right then. Now that we're on the same page, let's talk about how to move forward and stay alive. Chapter 7 Monica I couldn't get over feeling like I had to tiptoe around Constantine after that. I was careful not to make too much noise when I set down my teacup, afraid he would snap at me. If what he did in front of us was what my mother had witnessed at her house, the certainty that he was about to kill us, I could see why she was so frightened. The hair on the back of my neck nearly stood straight up, the energy in the room was so intense. I had spent almost my entire life with Constantine in the background, now he was front and center and running the show. We have to get you someplace safe, he muttered more to himself than to us. His hands clasped behind his back clenched and unclenched rhythmically. I wondered if he knew he was doing it, and wished he wouldn't. I could just imagine what one of those fists could do and didn't want the reminder of his power. But we were more powerful. And one of us could have thrown a spell at him in self-defense, I guess. I couldn't speak for my mother, but I knew I was too busy being scared half to death to even think about it. His eyes like fire bored into me. I shivered, rubbing my hands over my arms, rocking slightly. I don't know where that would be, I admitted, glancing my mother's way. What about you? You're the one with all the surprises tonight. Do you know someplace I could go? 
I might. I don't know the condition of the house, but it's extremely remote. Out on Long Island, on the beach. I haven't been there since you were very young. How old is it? I ax. Oh, at least a century. What are the odds it's still standing after Hurricane Sandy? Constantine ax. Mother made a face, like she couldn't believe he was so dense. It's protected, she explained. And I've sent people out to check besides. But they didn't go inside. How did I not know about it? I ax. Oh, if we went over everything you don't know, we'd be here all year, my mother sighed, waving a hand like it didn't matter. But it did. I had found out that I didn't know her at all, not really. The mother I thought I knew was demanding, yes. Sometimes controlling. But if anybody had told me she would steal my blood in some crazy effort to keep me safe, I would have said they didn't know who they were talking about. Not my mother. She wasn't insane. She wouldn't take part of me without my knowing it, even if she had the best intentions. Silly me, giving her that much credit. How long will it take to get there from here? Constantine acts. He stood at attention, almost bouncing on the balls of his feet, every muscle poised like he was ready to spring. I had never seen him so animated. An hour at the most. I wish there were some place further away, he mused. Yes, well, we have to make do with what we have, besides, I don't want her too far away right now. She took my hand and squeezed until the bones smashed together. Her way or no way. I should have known by then that it would be her way. From the look of resignation on Constantine's face, I could tell he knew it too. Chapter 8 Monica It wasn't much more than a shack or a cabin, built on a rocky bluff which extended into the sea almost like a pier. An old, extremely dangerous pier which nobody in their right mind would walk. Waves routinely crashed over it, waves big enough to knock down a full-grown man. But they never reached the little house, with its clapboard walls and stone chimney. It was like something out of a children's book. Or a horror movie, depending on the way a person looked at it. I leaned more toward horror movie, as I exited the car. The air had gone from just frigid to frigid and wet, and I immediately pulled my chunky scarf up covering my mouth and nose. Sea spray hit my hair and froze solid. Hurry. Get inside. Constantine wrapped a steel arm around me, before hurrying into the house. I wouldn't normally bring you right in with me, but I don't love the idea of leaving you alone in the car either. I'd pee pee, probably freeze to death, I managed to reply before stepping through the door and into the small, single first floor room. There was no fire in the hearth, of course, so it was almost as cold inside as out. I pulled my hand from where I jammed it into my pocket, and with a flick of my wrist, a warm glow lit the room and made the air feel less icy. I'll never get used to that, he muttered, checking the corners and the few pieces of furniture, a small round table by an old-fashioned iron stove, a cupboard which looked to hold plates but not much else, a chest that filled the air with the scent of cedar when Constantine opened it to check inside. Blankets and pillows, he announced as he pulled them out. Take off your coat and sit by the fire to warm up. Here. He handed me a blanket, and I guessed he meant for me to cover my shoulders with it. He was already halfway up the stairs by the time my coat was off. The board squeaked and groaned under his feet, I could follow him based on the sounds. Minutes later, he was on his way down. Two bedrooms. Bathroom. Outdated, but serviceable. The water still runs. He stood still for the first time since we'd arrived and looked around, hands on his hips. We could have done worse. I held my tongue. Sure, we could have, and for somebody like him, who lived in a room with a twin bed, dresser and tiny TV, it probably looked luxurious. I realized for the first time that I was pretty spoiled. I've always held myself above some of the other. How do I say it? More important coven members, I mused. Thinking it made me different, or better than them, because I lived in a regular little house. But this. I grimaced. I don't think anyone would expect you to be thrilled with the arrangements, he admitted as he folded his tall body to sit in an old-fashioned upholstered chair by the fire, 
the kind with velvet cushions and brass rivets around the edges. There was a matching chair across from it, and I pulled up a small footstool before sitting in it. I drew the blanket around me, appreciating its warmth and softness. We fell silent. What was there to say? The longer we spent without speaking, the easier it was for me to see that we didn't need to. I couldn't exactly read his thoughts, but I could sense impressions. He was strained to the point of being ready to snap. That was my fault, mine and my mother's. I was so bitterly disappointed in her, no matter the reason why she did what she did. And he could sense that too, I realized. He could sense everything going on inside me. How did my mother live knowing that for so long? It was like being naked all the time. I couldn't hide from him. I didn't want to. Even after he scared me half to death back at the house, and even though I knew he was only with me because of the connection my mother had forced us into, I couldn't keep my eyes off him. It had been brewing in me for months, and I finally understood why, the way he had taken up a spot in the corner of my brain and hadn't left yet. It was like the difference between when we first stepped inside the little house, when it was dark and cold, and the moment after the fire had sprung to life. A fire which had revealed everything around it, as it warmed the room. There was a fire in my brain. Do you feel it? I asked my voice soft. I was afraid to speak much louder, like anything above a whisper would break the quiet perfection of the moment. What? he murmured, staring into the fire. Look at me. Look at me, please. Tell me you know I'm here. I couldn't magic him into it. I wanted him to turn to me because he wanted to do it. The connection. The imprint. The way I've never felt this close to anybody before, and I'm afraid I might be tricking myself into thinking it's bigger than it is. Oh. Yes. I do, of course. His shoulders moved maybe an inch up and down. Barely a shrug. My heart ached. I mean, it's been happening for, what, two months? Maybe more? We never did get an exact starting date. I chewed my lip, watching him. Wishing. He nodded. When did you start feeling ill? I don't have the date written down, I chuckled. But yes, the general timeline works out. It was roughly a month of feeling bad before I left for my trip. I can't understand how she watched you fade away for weeks and didn't tell you why, he mused. She has a way of convincing herself she's right. The high sorceress of rationalizing, I explained, shaking my head. He surprised me with a snort of laughter. That's true. I've never thought much about her, I suppose. After so many years, I act surprised. Oh, I have eyes and ears. I've seen the sort of leader she is. I've seen the respect she commands. When compared to others I've guarded, she's easily the best suited for the job. I give her a great deal of credit for that. But when it comes to motivation and such, it's never interested me. What does interest you? I asked before thinking twice and wished I hadn't. I wouldn't know I had pushed too far until it was already too late. He took a deep breath, then let it out slowly. I'm sorry. I whispered blushing. I don't mean to pry into your life. It isn't that. Well, maybe it is, a little. Mostly? Nobody's asked me that, for as long as I can remember. That's not hyperbole. That's solid fact. The flickering fire sent light dancing over his chiseled features and made it impossible for me to read his expression. I thought the muscles in his jaw jumped a little, but it could have been my imagination. I'm sorry for that. Somebody should have asked you a long time ago. And ever since. Why? I don't have much of a life. None of us do. We're not allowed to. Vampires. He shook his head. Night wardens. I don't know about other vampires, I know they're out there and they do what they do. But they have no ties to us. They don't know we exist. When I thought about it, I realized he never went anywhere on his own. He stayed in his windowless room until my mother needed him to escort her somewhere. You can't ever make friends, I whispered. 
When did you finally figure that out? He asked in a flat low voice. He was right to be annoyed with me, or worse. He might not have been a major part of my life, but he was there, and I had taken him for granted. Not just his presence, but everything about him. He was just... Constantine. That was all. Until the imprinting started, and he became so much more. I should have seen it, I whispered shaking my head. What? The connection. I started caring about you all of a sudden, not caring for you, I added in a rush wishing I could crawl into a hole and never come out. But just the fact that I thought about you when I saw that sword. That I even went to Serbia in the first place. I felt this. I don't know. A need to see where you came from. I looked at the floor, breathless. I couldn't stop my mouth from opening and spilling more than I wanted to share. He let out a throaty chuckle. I have to admit, it was a surprise. Getting a gift from you, I mean. And I feel terrible that it should have been such a surprise, I admitted. You only feel that way because of the imprint. Without it, you'd go back to the way you were before. And you will, if your high council ever gives me the chance to continue as a night warden. But I don't want that. I blurted, before covering my mouth with both hands. The problem was, I didn't need to speak. He could feel the turmoil deep in my heart. He was better at hiding himself than I was, centuries of practice. I didn't have that practice under my belt. Everything going through my heart was on the surface, ready for him to see. If he saw everything, he was kind enough to pretend otherwise. You don't want to end the imprint. You realize how long it takes for your blood to leave my system? That's not what I mean. Why are you making this so difficult? I huffed. His fingers tapped on the arm of the chair, one after the other, on and on. That was the only part of his body moving. The rest of him was almost frighteningly still. Say something. Please. I'm pouring my heart out, and feeling like the world's biggest chump. The least you can do is say something back. Like what? His hard, unreadable eyes slid in my direction. Goosebumps covered my arms. Like, you could tell me I'm not the world's biggest chump. That would be a decent start. All right. All right what? All right you're not. What else? It was like pulling teeth. I guess I don't know what else. This is all a waste of time, and I wish I had never opened my mouth. I sprang up from the chair and went to the window. Get away from there, he muttered. Oh. That's all I had to do to get a reaction from you? I walked to the other side of the room, as far away from him as I could get. I wanted to die. I wished the damned sorcerer, whoever he was, would show up and get the job over with. It would be easier than the crushing humiliation that stretched out minute after painful minute. Well that's the reason we're here. To protect you. That's part of protecting you. I threw my arms into the air, wishing I could use my magic on him after all. Not to make him feel something for me, but to hurt him for being such a moron. For your information, if a powerful sorcerer wanted to find me, he wouldn't walk around looking through windows. He can see without use of his eyes. That was how he found the coven in the first place. Somehow he tracked me down. So it doesn't matter if he's standing out there right this very minute, though I doubt he would be, because it would mean tipping his hand. Anything else you'd like to add, he raised a brow. Rage boiled over to match the tears spilling onto my cheeks. Yes. I think you're a nasty, cruel bastard. There. That enough for you? I turned toward the wall, arms wrapped around me with my dangerous magic hands tucked close to my ribs, trying hard to hide my tears and the way my body shook from them. I could still hear his heavy groan over my sniffles. I thought you were smarter than this. Smarter? I choked out. Is that supposed to be a compliment? Because I have to tell you, it's not working. I'm only saying that I gave you a little more credit than this. I thought you could be mature. Or at least, do a little thinking before you reacted. What does that mean? Thinking about what? About what this means for me. And the way things are supposed to be. 
How are they supposed to be? I looked over my shoulder. You should know by now. You probably don't remember a time when Marissa wasn't high sorceress. But after all this time, you ought to know what a night warden's relationship should be to the witch they guard. We're never to become involved in each other's personal life, no matter what. And? I sneered. And just because rules don't matter to you doesn't mean they don't exist. They matter to me. My life hangs in the balance. I turned and leaned against the wall, running my hands over my eyes to pick up any stray tears. I'll make sure nobody tries to punish you for this. I'm sure that will make a tremendous difference, he growled. I'll consider myself lucky if my sire isn't killed for this. And when he's gone, we're gone. All the night wardens. Because he turned you? He nodded with a frown. Sorry. I don't know about any of these things. I hate to ask questions that might hurt. It doesn't hurt. It simply is. I see. That was a lie. I didn't see anything. It's cruel. That's not for me to say. That was the rule one of your high sorceresses set down a long time ago. She was cruel but she was in pain. I've had a lot of time to think about it, he muttered with a wry look. She lost her daughter. Isn't that right? Yes. One eyebrow quirked up. Mothers can do rather illogical things where their children are concerned. My mouth fell open in surprise and I laughed. It was such a relief, even if I didn't feel quite right doing it. I realized he was laughing too, which was an even bigger surprise. I didn't think he knew how. When our laughter died down, it was just the two of us again. We looked at each other for a long time. I could feel his helplessness, he was letting me feel it. His hopelessness. The way he struggled to fight off something inside. He hid what it was though. Like a brick wall between us. You should get some sleep, he decided. There's a fireplace in both bedrooms, so one's as good as another. I hesitated. We would never get that moment back again. Maybe it was for the best. I turned and went upstairs with my suitcase in one hand, and the blanket closed tight around my neck with the other. I felt his eyes on me as I climbed the creaky stairs, but he didn't say a word. Chapter 9 Constantine That was a long night. All nights were long for me, but that one was the worst. I hadn't brought anything to keep me occupied. No television, of course. No electricity. Nothing to do but think. Which was what I didn't want to do which was why I had started drowning out my thoughts with hours of television in the first place. I leaned my head back against the chair. Furniture had been so uncomfortable at one time. Form over function. Not that it mattered whether I was comfortable. Such things had stopped mattering long before now. The hearth was what did it. An old-fashioned brick hearth. Deep. The sort my mother used for cooking. The hours we had spent around the hearth together, my family. At the end of a long cold night, it was the best place to be. We didn't have to talk or do much of anything. Simply being together, staring into the fire, was enough. Not like modern families with their technology and distractions. Maybe that was why we had been so happy. We never had to think about happiness, of course. It wasn't a conscious pursuit back then. Still. I remembered a deep, sure well of contentment in those quiet family moments. Until he found me. Ralph. He was my sire, and the reason for my never-ending torment. He had created me, and created the slavery I labored under. I owed him, and I owed him nothing at the same time. I looked across from me, to the other chair where Monica had sat. I could almost see her there with the light from the fire turning the auburn in her hair to copper. Her image dissolved, replaced by my sister. Marjorie had the same sort of color, while Beatrice had inherited father's dark hair and green eyes. As I had. They used to tease me as sisters did, and I gave as good as I got. Until the night I went hunting alone. Until I couldn't stay away from them anymore. 
The sound of Monica's footsteps on the stairs startled me. I would have noticed sooner if I hadn't been so deep inside the horror of that last night around the hearth. I leapt to my feet, instantly on the alert. What happened? I asked, going to her, looking upstairs. Nothing. She rubbed her bleary eyes. I'm sorry to give you the wrong idea. Everything's fine. I was having trouble sleeping. I know you don't sleep, so... Of course. I stepped aside. She hesitated for a moment before going to the fire, warming her hands in front of it. Then she sat, still with a blanket around her shoulders. I didn't mean to interrupt whatever you were doing down here, she whispered. Anna, I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable earlier. Maybe that was why I couldn't sleep, because I felt too much guilt and embarrassment. You don't have to. Really? I sat back down not far from where she was. We don't need to talk, she decided. I mean, we can just sit here. I know you were thinking or watching or whatever, so you can just go back to that and pretend I'm not here. It's enough to sit here and not be alone. She looked at me. I looked away. I was thinking. That much is true, I admitted. I was careful to keep my eyes turned toward the fire. I'm not sure it's anything you'd be keen on hearing. You don't know that. Fine, then it's nothing I'm keen on sharing, I said with half-smile to temper my words. That's a different story. I looked around as all the old memories crashed together in my head, and I didn't want to hold them inside. It had been too long. Speaking of my people would make them real again, and they deserved that. They had lived. This place, it reminds me of the home I grew up in. There was only the one floor. We slept on straw covered in blankets. It was the way life was in those days, the family sharing a floor. We had a hearth like this one, and the table around which we sat when we took our meals. My parents, my two sisters, and I. Coming here has brought the memories back, strong as ever. I'm sure you miss them, she whispered. I do. I miss a great many things. I envy them at times, too. They have their rest. They lived good, honest lives and have gone to their reward. Whatever that is. Even if it's nothing but darkness and emptiness, it's better than some of the alternative. She was at a loss. I felt the confusion clouding her judgment, the way I could feel her cloudy judgment regarding me. Us. Only there was no us. I had to make that crystal clear. There was no such thing as us. Is your life really that bad? She asks. It's better if we don't talk much about my life, or what I'm thinking. I got up and did a scan of the stony stretch outside the window. The sky was turning gray, meaning morning wasn't far off. Darkness concealed too many threats. Why not? She couldn't see me close my eyes, or the way I bit my lip to keep from snapping at her. She insisted on asking stupid questions, prying into things she had no business knowing about, forcing me to admit things I had no intention of ever telling a living soul. Do you know the worst part? I asked, barely whispering, still gazing out at a sky lightening more with every passing minute. What? The way I can't fight you. Not for long, at any rate. Because you're in my head, only it's more than that. I didn't know it was happening, until it had already happened. When a vampire imprints on a witch, he knows what he's in for. He can steel himself against her from the first moment and every moment thereafter. Over time, it's easier. I turned my head to look down at her, still wrapped in her blanket by the fire. I wasn't able to do that with you, Monica, because I didn't know of the switch. The damage has been done. We're too deeply connected now. And if that weren't bad enough, the way her face lit up like the sky after a storm would have been. Everything she thought or felt was written there for me to see. So it isn't just me, she breathed, beaming. You have to see why this is dangerous. It's no good for you to know too much about me or to ask questions. Especially when I want to tell you everything. I turned away again, smashing my fist against the window frame. The wood splintered. You can. 
I want you to. Her voice was a seductive whisper, calling to me, begging me, pleading to be heard. Why are you doing this to me? I snarled softly, watching as the first beams of true sunlight appeared on the horizon. I couldn't look at her. It was too dangerous. I'm not trying to do anything to you. I'm not, I swear. But you are. Damn you. Damn Marissa. I hung my head. Damn me. It was too late for that. I was already damned. I smelled my skin sizzling an instant before I felt it and jumped back from the window, throwing myself into the darkest corner as I howled in agony. The sun. I yelled, pulling my v-neck shirt off so it wouldn't run against the exposed skin of my throat and upper chest. I was blistering already as pain seared through my soul. What? Why? Monica jumped up and rushed to me, kneeling in front of my crouching body. Here. Let me see. No. Don't touch. I squeezed my eyes shut and gasped for air. I had never known physical pain like it. The spell. The raw protection. Monica covered her face with her hands. You've imprinted on me, but I never performed the spell. Of course. Another thoughtless act on Marissa's part. Maybe not so thoughtless, though, when I thought about it. She hasn't asked me to leave my room or the house in daylight since before you left for your trip, I realized, hissing through gritted teeth. She knew this would happen. She must have forgotten to warn us, she said, disgusted. I know the spell. I can perform it now. What about this? I grunted, struggling to control myself so I could control the pain and failing miserably. Every move was agony, and the sun had only touched part of my throat and a few inches of my chest. What if I hadn't been wearing a shirt? We'll see what happens. Here. Lie down. She backed up to give me room, and I stretched out on my back. Her hands hovered inches over my abdomen as she closed her eyes and lifted her head. I didn't understand the words. They were in a language foreign to my ears, something which had already been ancient even when I was born. Her voice was lyrical, almost gliding from one word to the next, weaving a tapestry around the two of us as she asked for raw sacred help and protection against the sun's deadly rays. I let her lull me into an almost painless state as I looked up into her beautiful face. She was so good, so innocent. I had blamed our situation on her, the fact that she bought the sword at all, but she did it for me. She wouldn't have if her mother hadn't deceived us. Her full lips parted slightly as she murmured on and on, and she seemed to glow from the inside. My hands ached to touch her. Silence spread over the room as the spell ended, and I gasped when I realized the pain was gone. The surprise was the only thing that could have kept me from taking her in my arms just then. I touched ginger fingertips to my throat and felt nothing but light scarring. She opened her eyes and let out a cross between a laugh and a sob. I really hoped that would work, she gasped, chuckling without a sound. Her hands shook slightly as she lowered them to my chest. Why are you shaking? I asked, covering her hands with mine. Because you're mine now. At least for a while. I was supposed to protect you, the way you protect me. And I failed. You didn't know. If you had been hurt worse, if you had died. She turned her head to the side, eyes closed. I'm sorry. You're right, of course. Just ignore me. I'll learn how to deal with all this emotional stuff. I won't make it any harder on you. I stood at the edge of a cliff with a choice to make. Step back, away from the danger. Step forward and fall headlong into something I knew would only make things infinitely worse. I knew what was ahead of me as I sat partway up and took her face in my hand, turning it toward me. I kissed away the salty tears before finding her waiting mouth. Bloodlust was never anything like this. The same all-consuming need swept over me as always, but it wasn't blood I needed. It was her. I slid my hand around to the back of her head and held her closer, opening her mouth with my tongue and plunging inside. Her groan vibrated against my lips and sent my passion soaring. Suddenly, 
Nothing else mattered but everything about her. Chapter 10 Monica I sighed stretching. Happy. His body wasn't exactly warm, but with the fire at my back it didn't matter. His muscular shoulder made a good pillow. If anybody had told me a couple of months ago that we would end up this way, I would never have believed it. I probably would have recommended psychiatric help, I murmured with a smile. That's not a glowing recommendation, he chuckled. You know what I mean. Would you believe anybody if they told you about this? That you would be sleeping with a witch one day? No. Just like that. Flat. No tone. Just no. See? But here we are. Life can surprise. Just when I thought there were no surprises left, he whispered. I craned my neck so I could see his face. A happy surprise, I hope. What do you think? He looked down at me with a tender smile, before kissing my forehead. I hope I was all right for you. It's been a long time. Better than all right. I was still quivering inside, and wasn't sure I'd be able to walk if I tried. His smile widened a little, and I felt his pride. I can say with all honesty, that I can't remember the last time I had such great sex. I laughed. A sense of humor wasn't what I expected from him, not after so many years of him being serious as a heart attack. Gloomy, glowering. The light coming through the window had turned warm and soft. I realized with a start that we had been together all day, right here like this, doing things that made me marvel. My stomach rumbled accordingly. I haven't eaten all day, I announced. I only brought a few protein bars with me, to keep me going until things got settled. Protein bars? I don't even like the sound of that. He sat up and watched me pad across the room to the little counter by the sink, where I'd left my purse. I pulled two foil-wrapped bars from it before returning, and could feel his eyes following my every move. I was completely naked of course, and my face tingled with a blush. Why are you so shy? He asked as I wrapped a blanket around my shoulders and sat on the second blanket we'd spread on the floor. Can't I keep my most shameful feelings to myself? I asked with a humorless chuckle before biting into my breakfast. Or was it a late lunch? You're right. It's poor form for a night warden to remind a witch that he can read her feelings. Forgive me. There's nothing to forgive, I smiled, placing my hand over the one he used to stroke my knee. But as long as you ax, it's because? I don't know. You've never seen me like this before, and it's one thing to see me naked when we're in the middle of something, but another to see me walk across the room with nothing on. Have you ever heard humans talk about beer goggles? He frowned. I think so. When a person is so drunk, everything looks good to them. Something like that, I giggled. There are lust goggles too. That's what I mean. Ah. I see. You don't have to worry about that, you look just as good to me as ever. My cheeks burned furiously. He smiled. It's true. If I looked half as good as you, I don't know that I would ever put clothes on. That got me to laugh, and I threw my head back as I did. Please. You look like an underwear model. I don't know what that is, but I take it you're giving me a compliment. A very strong compliment, I agreed as I polished off the first bar. Not as satisfying as actual food, but it would do. His hand slid up my thighs. You have nothing to be embarrassed about. The tone of his voice had changed, becoming deeper and more intimate. The energy between us changed too, and I welcomed it. He leaned in to kiss me, gently, but his lips lingered a little longer than they needed to and sent shivers down my spine. Um. Chocolate? He licked the corner of his mouth. Or what passes for chocolate when it's supposed to be healthy, I grinned. Do you like chocolate? It's all right. I wouldn't seek it out. But I used to have a terrible sweet tooth, my mother used to scold me for stealing treats. Said she couldn't make them fast enough. His smile was tender, sweet, full of regret. I reached out to cup his cheek in my palm. I can tell you love them very much. I did. I suppose I still do. 
that sort of connection never goes away. It's not like imprinting when the connection fades as blood leaves the system. That struck me. I could tell he didn't know what he was saying or how it would sound to my ears because he didn't so much as flinch. Deep down, I knew our connection wouldn't last forever. He didn't need to bring it up, though. Which reminds me, do you need to feed? I couldn't look into his eyes when I ax. I'd never forget the sight of him feeding from my mother, sucking greedily from the wrist he held in his clawed hands while she closed her eyes and submitted to him. It was horrifying and intimate, and too much for me to process all at once. Look at me. His voice was deep, sonorous and undeniable. I didn't have a choice, but to do as he commanded. His eyes were the same green, ringed in red. You're ashamed to ax, aren't you? Not ashamed. Just unpracticed. This isn't a responsibility I was prepared to take on. He nodded slowly. It was unfair for your mother to put this on your shoulders. I'm sorry for you. But yes, I do need to feed. I need to be strong when we face our foe. And we will. You know that, don't you? Yes, I whispered with a sinking heart. We could play house all we wanted. We could cuddle up by the fire and pretend nothing else existed but the two of us. We would only be fooling ourselves and making it easier for a threat to take advantage. I have to protect you. That's all that matters. It's why I exist. His fingertips grazed my cheek, my jaw, my throat. They lingered there. I felt my pulse racing beneath them. So did he. His eyes started to change as the overwhelming need for blood began taking over. His breathing changed too, becoming rapid and shallow. Take what you need, I whispered, tilting my head to the side. I wanted to give myself to him, to know part of me was keeping him alive. It made no sense. It made all the sense in the world. I was there for him and he was there for me. We needed each other. And my blood would help him do what he had to do. It was almost beautiful. He drew closer. His hot breath sent a shiver through me as his lips grazed my skin. So sweet, he whispered, his tongue darting over the spot where my pulse throbbed. I gripped his shoulders, eyes closed, holding my breath for the moment when his fangs pierced my skin. And when they did, the pain made me cry out and grip him tighter. He cradled me at first, arms around my waist, holding our bodies close together while his mouth latched onto my throat. Pain faded, replaced with a sense of being drained. One of his hands curled around the back of my throat and held me in place as he sucked the life out of me, breathing hard and fast and grunting like an animal. I gave myself up, abandoned myself to him to use as he wanted. I knew deep in my heart without having to think about it, that he wouldn't go too far. I floated away, knowing I could trust him even as I felt my body growing weak and he crushed me against him. Enough, he grunted, pulling away with a wrenching groan, panting heavily. My eyes opened slowly. He had lowered me to the floor as he fed. I stared up at the ceiling, trying to regain a sense of myself. I had floated so far away. Are you all right? His face came into focus as he hovered over me. I tried to smile as I nodded, but I was too tired. Was that how it always was? I opened my mouth to ax, but he anticipated my question. Your mother rationed the blood she gave me. I never felt like there was enough. Now I understand why. She had to keep her supply up. No wonder she wanted to visit you as soon as you got back. She needed more. I remembered how I felt when I was so sick. Yes, it was the same. The total exhaustion. I wouldn't have taken so much if I wasn't so hungry, he explained, and deep frown lines creased his forehead. I'm sorry. I went too far. It's all right. I want you to have what you need. You have a job to do, right? My smile was stronger that time, and it seemed to comfort him a little. He stretched out on one side and drew me to him, and I let myself feel small and vulnerable against his larger, stronger body as he held me. I understand now why the bloodlust kept coming up on me so suddenly. It all makes so much sense. I can't believe I didn't see it. None of it matters now. All that mattered 
was that I get a little sleep. I could barely speak, I was so tired. Chapter 11 Monica My eyes flew open when I recognized the sound of a motor. My head was on Constantine's chest. I sat up, just about all of my muscles cried out in protest after spending so many hours on a wood floor. What's that? He disentangled us and sprang to his feet, crouching low as he approached the window. He was poised to spring, even without clothes on. I could have kicked myself for leaving us both so vulnerable, lying around naked in front of the fire for an entire day. He muttered a curse. It's your mother. Oh no. I grabbed my clothes and flew upstairs while he performed his speed demon act downstairs. I heard furniture moving back into place as I jammed my legs into clean pants and pulled a thick turtleneck sweater over my head. My hair was must, the way it would be after good sex, and I did my best to smooth it down before giving up and clipping it in a bun on the back of my head. All the while, I asked myself what she was doing there. What the hell was she doing there? Does she want to attract attention? I muttered through my teeth as I shoved my feet into faux fur boots. She was at the door. I heard her knock. The fact that she bothered to knock would have made me laugh, if my heart wasn't busy knocking against my ribs much louder. I hurried to the top of the stairs and heard her questions. Is it comfortable enough? Do you have everything you need? She'll need more food. I brought some of her favorites. I forced a smile as I walked down the stairs. Smothering me as always. Did she even know my favorites anymore? We hadn't lived together in half a lifetime. I found her putting food in the cupboards. She wrinkled her nose when she saw how dusty they were but a flick of her wrist took care of that. One of the first sets of spells a witch learned when she began honing her powers, basic household tasks. Ah, there you are. Her smile faltered when she looked at me over her shoulder. She saw something wrong with me. I should have known she would. What had I missed? I touched my hair, self-conscious, and the tiny wound on my throat seemed to tingle beneath the thick heavy wool. Like she knew it was there. What did she expect? She was the one who forced us into our mess. He had to feed, and it had to be from me. Why did you take a chance like this? I asked, eyes shifting toward the window. Her car was out there. Don't you think this is bit over-obvious if anyone is watching? I couldn't transport myself here with all these groceries. Besides, I doubt anybody would watch you. What if they're watching you? Constantine leaned against the closed door, arms folded. One of them could have followed you here. One of whom, she asks, raising an eyebrow. Do you even know who we're dealing with? My heart skipped a beat. Do you? I know what you sound like when you think you're the smartest person in the room. So do I, Constantine agreed. She shrugged it off. One thing about my mother, she was fine with admitting how full of herself she could be sometimes. I did something I never thought I would do. What steal my blood? Lie to me and your night warden. Make me think I was dying and not tell me otherwise. What did you do this time? I sighed. I spoke with my sister. You what? I asked Cressida for her help. I explained what was happening and that I needed information on any known sorcerers still in Europe. All of the ancient texts are in the possession of her coven. She always was selfish that way. I'll never forget the time. They found something? Constantine prompted. I had to bite the side of my tongue to keep from laughing at his obvious redirection. Yes. An ancient sorcerer named Ivan. From all accounts, he was alive at the time of the Siege of Belgrade, where that sword was originally used. I don't understand. I didn't think sorcerers could live that long. She shrugged. There are many ways a magical being can prolong their life. Many of which I don't like to consider. Terribly dark magic. Brutal. Where does he live now? I ax. From all accounts, Serbia. Somewhere in the mountains. Some intrepid thief must have taken their life in their hands to steal that sword. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes when Ivan found out. 
I shivered. No. Neither would I. The sound of that awful bone-chilling voice coming from my mother's mouth. I didn't want to meet the sorcerer that voice belonged to. Her skirt swept across the room as she took tour. It didn't take long, the room being so small. I remember this place well. I spent so many happy times here. Funny, you never mentioning that it existed. Her smile faltered. Yes, well, some places have a way of connecting themselves to unhappy situations too. And that was when I knew it had something to do with my father, who we never spoke about in more than passing. One of the few hard and fast rules she held in place. No wonder she hadn't been back in so long. Constantine was about to say something when he went still, head cocked to the side. When my mother made a move toward him, he cut his eyes in her direction. Something in them froze her in place. I was afraid to breathe. Something's here, he whispered so faintly I could hardly hear him. I wasn't sure how he could know, I didn't hear anything, and the look on my mother's face told me she didn't either. But he had a sixth sense. I didn't understand it, but I knew it was there. He looked from her to me and understood. Come on, my mother whispered, pulling my hands. Let's go upstairs. What? No. I won't hide. I pulled back, away from her, trying to stay with Constantine. Listen to her, he growled, shoving me a little as he walked past me. We weren't lovers anymore, if we ever had been. I was his charge, and he was my night warden, and all that mattered was him doing his job. I don't want to leave you. But I followed my mother upstairs anyway, and into one of the bedrooms. She closed the door behind us, then waved her hand to move the dresser and bed in front of it. Not like it would matter. If there was a threat out there, they would easily get past a couple of pieces of furniture. I turned to her with a snarl. So, nobody would follow you here, huh? Chapter 12 Constantine I tuned my sharp senses to the sounds around me, listening hard. The ever-crashing waves outside faded into the background as I picked up the muffled footsteps. Uneven, slow, unsure. The sound of someone trying to sneak up and being very, very bad at their job. They were coming from behind the house, where it looked out onto the water. I stood beside the single window and eased just enough of my head in front of it to see outside. Everything looked normal. A typical evening in a little shack which had been deserted until 24 hours prior. Both cars sat out there, untouched. Or so it seemed. I focused my gaze on the space beneath the cars and noticed two pairs of feet in dark boots. That was all it took for the fangs to extend, the claws to dig into my palms. I turned into an animal, relying on instinct to decide my next move. I watched and waited. Did they know I was standing there? Did they even know I was aware of them? I strained my ears and could just make out their whispers, but I couldn't pick up anything they were saying. Making a plan, maybe. Who were they that they would show up here? Had Ivan come with his forces, or had he sent them in his place? If they were sorcerers, or even warlocks, I had to act before they had the chance to use their magic on me. Instead of using the back door to confront them, I sped over to the front and opened, then closed it as quietly as possible. There wasn't a sound, even to my hypersensitive ears. In the blink of an eye, I was behind them, watching them. The wind barely stirred. Two men. Big, brutish, but men just the same. Crouched behind the car whispering angrily to each other, trying to decide who would take the back and who would take the front. Where's the sword? Just get the sword, one of them hissed. You know what he said. We have to prove they're dead. Too late, I snarled practically on top of them by then. They hardly had time to look up and react with terror before my claws sliced through the air and then through their throats. They gurgled and gasped, covering the gaping wounds in a feeble attempt to hold on to their pathetic lives. I watched, more satisfied by the second, as blood pumped through their fingers and spattered to the ground. I didn't even want it. The scent and sight meant nothing to me. Not when it came from them. When it was over, and their bodies were still, 
I dragged them inside by their collars and dropped them on the floor. Better lighting didn't make them any more attractive. They looked like two ordinary humans, and they had been speaking English. But they knew about the sword. It was no accident, them showing up when they did. Constantine, is everything all right? Monica called down. Yes. Stay there. I had no way of knowing if they were alone, the two thieves. Murderers. Then I had a second thought. Marissa, I need you. The sliding of furniture. A barely whispered argument. Monica didn't want to stay up there. I would have appreciated her spirit if it wasn't so exhausting sometimes. Only Marissa, I snapped. The door slammed in response. I sighed. Marissa swept down the steps and froze in horror when she saw when I had dragged inside. What? Who? I don't know who, but they were outside. I took care of them, as you can see, but it would be better to have a few answers. I should have stopped at one, I reflected. You did what you're supposed to do, she reasoned, stepped carefully around the bodies. The blood had already congealed at their throats and was starting to dry on their clothes, soaked into the black jackets and shirts they wore. Is there anything you can do? Do. She was too busy examining them to understand. You know. Bring one of them back, if only for a minute. Her head snapped up. Do you realize what you're asking of me? Do you realize how dangerous it could be, not knowing what we're up against? They spoke English. They knew about the sword. They were supposed to kill whoever was in this house. Her skin went pale. I nodded, glad that she understood the severity. I want to know how they ended up here and where Ivan is. She hesitated. It isn't simple, playing with the laws of life and death. I don't imagine that it is, but I know how powerful you are. If anyone can do it, you can. She grimaced. This is hardly the time for flattery. Still, she rolled up her sleeves with a determined expression. All right. This won't be easy, but I can bring him back for a minute or two. He'll speak through me, since he doesn't have working vocal cords anymore. She was right about that. I had shredded both their throats beyond recognition. They looked like raw hamburger. I watched, transfixed, as she extended her hands over one of the two bodies and closed her eyes, murmuring some ancient language I had never heard. Just when I thought there was nothing left about witches to surprise me. Her brow furrowed in concentration, and her lips moved rapidly over words and phrases, almost like she was singing. She swayed slightly, front to back, side to side, lost in a trance. The words faded into silence. I wondered if the spell had worked at all. Suddenly, the man's chest rose as he took a breath. I had seen so many things in my centuries of life, but never that. I forced myself to stay still and calm. What does he know? I whispered, eyes locked on the suddenly animated corpse. Hired on the dark web. Marissa muttered in a voice that sounded nothing like her own. It was raspy low, with a strong Brooklyn accent. Guy wanted a sword brought back to him. Girl stole it from him. Wanted proof she was dead. A tear rolled down her cheek. Where is this mystery person? I ax. Don't know. Someplace not too far. Couldn't do it himself. Gave us a dress to deliver the sword and the proof. Where? I breathed. Manhattan. My breath caught. Manhattan. So close. And this is where the client lives? I prodded. She frowned. Don't know. Maybe. But it was Manhattan, for sure. He would pay on delivery. Yes, I was sure he would pay. I had only hastened their deaths. He would surely have done it himself. I had never met Ivan but I had a fairly strong impression of him already. The chest rose and fell, rose and fell, then stopped. Marissa lowered her arms and opened her eyes, blinking rapidly. I helped her to a chair by the fire. Did you see anything else? Feel anything else? I asked, studying her face. She shook her head. It was all so dark and confused. 
He doesn't realize he's dead yet, she murmured, passing a hand over her eyes. I'm sorry. I know he was terrible for doing what he was about to do, but I don't think he was exactly skilled at it. He sounded so desperate and mixed up. Who wouldn't be desperate if they were about to do something like he was setting out to do? I couldn't bring myself to feel the same compassion she did. He's better off dead. We have to focus on Ivan. Why wouldn't he come on his own? She shook herself. It does seem strange that he would post an ad online, even in the darkest corners of the internet. I know there are postings like this out there, hundreds or thousands of them. To think one of them involved my daughter. Our eyes met. Maybe he's too weak to do it himself. He wasn't too weak to possess you at the meeting, I reminded her. You're right, but a sorcerer's powers don't necessarily align with his physical state. I know of many who only became more powerful as the years went on. It's similar for witches. That's great news, I muttered darkly. When he finds that his delivery men are dead, what then? He might already know, somehow. He might. He knew where to send them, so he must know much more than I gave him credit for. She covered her face. I underestimated him. I fooled myself into thinking I could keep her safe. That's my job now. He would come for it. I knew he would. How, I couldn't say. If the sword was important enough for him to travel all this way and sent two hitmen for it, he'd come on his own when he knew that plan had failed. He couldn't keep sending people after us. It would take too much time, and we would be on the alert. I got up and sidestepped the bodies to go to the window. He'll come. He might even already be on his way. You think so? Don't you? I looked over my shoulder to where she still sat, hands clenched. She hesitated. She didn't want to agree, but eventually nodded. You can't keep me locked in here forever. Monica screamed down the stairs. I closed my eyes and reminded myself of what was at stake. She can come down. It's better she knows everything. I looked out into the darkness. Something tells me we'll need all the help we can get against a sorcerer like him. Chapter 13 Monica Two dead men. The sight of their gaping throats turned my stomach, but not as much as the thought of what they were sent there to do to me. I wonder if they had any idea what they were walking into, I murmured, shaking my head. He could at least have sent somebody with magic. Or with some defenses. Maybe he expected this, my mother mused, looking out the back window while Constantine took the front. He wouldn't have risked the life of someone like himself. He wanted to see what they would come up against. Well now he knows I'm sure, Constantine snarled. I didn't have to look at him to know his fangs were extended, he sounded different when they were out. And he'll know what's between you two. Do everything you can to hide it from him, my mother warned. I stared at the back of her head. What did you say? The two of you. He'll know. She sighed. Yet another thing I never considered, what imprinting would do to you when you weren't aware of it. I'm so sorry. You must believe I had the best intentions. I believe you did, Constantine said. They stood with their backs to each other, still looking out the windows. How do you know? I asked her as a flush crept over my skin. My mother. How awkward. I was a grown woman, but it still made me want to crawl under a rock and hide. Her response was brisk, businesslike. I sensed it as soon as I walked in. You're in love with each other, or lust at least. Be careful. He'll exploit that as soon as he can. In love? I watched Constantine and wished he would do something, anything to let me know if it was true. Did he love me? Did I love him? One day spent in each other's arms didn't have to mean love. I was afraid to believe it, afraid he would deny it and crush my hopes. He didn't react. Neither did I. There's a storm coming up, she said, changing the subject. A big one. I joined her at the window. In the distance, out over the water, storm clouds built. 
Lightning zigzagged between them, sometimes stretching down to meet the water. It was a beautiful sight. Majestic. There was nothing like an electrical storm over the ocean. But this was different. I felt it in my bones. So did she. We exchanged worried glances. The clouds moved too quickly and were too large, growing in size every second, billowing across the sky. The lightning had a green tinge to it, and the bolts were too large. And too many. He's coming, I announced. Constantine flew to my side. This is it. He's not one for playing small, is he? So much for the element of surprise. He destroyed that when he sent those two, my mother pointed out, nodding in their direction. He might as well make a big show now, since we're expecting him. He wants to intimidate us, I whispered, staring out the window at the ever-growing storm. The wind howled, whipping the sea into a frenzy. Waves crashed louder and higher than ever before, one on top of the other, towering higher and higher but never quite reaching the little house. Our magic was just as strong as his. Knowing that filled me with pride, even as my insides quaked in fear. I need you to promise me something. Constantine took me by my shoulders and turned me to face him. His eyes searched mine. Promise me you won't do anything stupid. Don't try to be a hero. Don't put yourself in harm's way. It's my job to protect you, but I can't do that if you act foolishly. Do you understand? I do. And you won't take any chances? I'll do my best not to, I said, unsure what else I could promise. He sighed. I suppose that will have to be enough. His fingers pressed hard into my shoulders. There was so much I wanted to say, so much that it bubbled up in my throat and threatened to spill out. But there wasn't enough time. I did love him. He was full of secrets and could be a complete mystery to me, yet I loved him. And I would love him no matter what happened, even if the High Council decided we could never be together. Should we go out and meet him? My mother acts, looking over her shoulder at us. Constantine nodded, still staring at me. Yes. I think we should. He went to the cupboard, where I had left the sword when we arrived, and took it out of its wrappings. The blade seemed to glow like it was lit from within. He handed it to me, and I could have sworn the handle vibrated against my palm. I looked at my mother, then back at him. Let's go then. He led the way, and I followed, with my mother bringing up the rear. When I felt the force of the wind against my skin, and heard the thunder and the crashing of the waves, I suddenly felt outmatched. Severely outmatched. Who were we in the face of power like that? Sword or no sword? Where is he? My mother shouted, looking around. Come out. We're waiting for you. Constantine stood with claws and fangs at the ready. Our eyes met for just the briefest moment as lightning streaked through the sky, and I caught sight of his deep red irises. I could only stand there, feet planted on the rocks leading out into the water, sword at my side. It was small but heavy. Heavier than it should have felt. And magic. How had I not sensed that before? Maybe it was Ivan's proximity that made the magic easier to sense. Thunder rumbled, long and deep, and in it I heard the whisper of a name. Monica. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end as I looked at my mother. Her eyes were wide, frightened. She held out a hand and I took it. I'm here. I screamed into the wind. You know I'm here. You know I have your sword. It's yours. I don't want it. You took what is mine. I didn't know. He tricked me. Constantine's head was practically on a swivel, looking for a threat he couldn't see. I tried to catch his eye, but it was impossible when he was so busy waiting to attack. The stone shook under my feet. You must pay. Screw you. I shrieked, not caring who he was or what he thought about it. I'm giving it to you. I'm telling you, it was a mistake. Let's end all this damn drama and meet each other face to face, Ivan. It wasn't my imagination. The storm calmed a bit. Not entirely, but enough that I could hear myself think even though the water still churned and crashed and lightning still set the sky on fire. 
He didn't know I knew his name, I realized. The clouds almost directly overhead started swirling, circling, forming themselves into what looked like a whirlpool which slowly stretched down into a funnel cloud. The three of us struggled to stay on our feet, as the wind kicked up even stronger, whipping at us, threatening to pull the sword from my hand. I tightened my grasp and kept my head high as the cloud touched down, then disappeared. In its place was a stooped, painfully thin man in a dark suit. His sparse white hair nearly brushed his knees. His eyes were a pale watery blue, but they burned into me nonetheless. You? Constantine snarled. You're the one doing all this? An old man? Those pale eyes flickered over to where Constantine stood, ready to fight. Appearances can deceive, the old man hissed. Ivan, I said in the same loud firm voice I had used before. He turned to me. The very same. He attempted to bow, but didn't get very far down. You'll excuse my appearance. I've been without my sword for some time, and it's left me in a bit of a shambles. What does the sword have to do with anything? I ax, holding it as tightly as ever. That's none of your business. And yet, even without his explanation, I thought I understood. Images flashed through my mind like photographs. A castle cold and dark, full of souvenirs and antiques. Hundreds of years, all represented in rooms full of artwork and pottery and weaponry, books and jewelry and sculpture. But the sword was most important of all, kept in a bedroom away from everything else. A man sneaking into the bedroom, climbing through the window, taking the sword and anything else he could get his hands on. Selling it to the peddler, who unloaded it on me. It was more than a sword. It was Ivan's way of staying alive. I had no idea how I knew, but the idea sat in my brain as surely as if it were a long-established fact. The wooden handle was warm, tingling. Seeing as how you're here to take it back, and you've already sent assassins to steal it away, I think it's very much my business. Not to mention the money I spent in purchasing it, I added. You made the purchase under false pretenses. He wasn't shouting, but somehow I could hear him over the storm. Like his voice was in my head instead of coming from his mouth. Through no fault of her own, my mother stepped in. His eyes crawled over her. A high sorceress, he sneered. You know I am. You possessed me. That I did, he admitted with what I supposed was a shrug. I had little choice. I had to make myself known. And you were so open to my influence. Open, she laughed. Indeed. You no longer have your protection, do you? He looked at Constantine and smiled, revealing brown and yellow teeth, cracked and broken. Your night warden was no longer in your service, thus leaving you vulnerable in more ways than just physically. When he noted my mother's surprise, Ivan's nasty smile widened. It seems I know more about you than you about yourself, powerful one. It sounded very much like the insult Ivan intended it to be. I opened my mouth to shoot back a remark about how easy it was for us to find who he was, when an image flashed through my head and wiped out everything around me. One moment I was standing on a rocky bluff, and the next I was in the middle of a bloody battle. I looked around terrified, as men grappled and punched and stabbed and pummeled. There was a castle to my back and archers shot arrows from the highest spot, but the men they fired at had shields which they raised to defend themselves. Crude shields, much like the rest of the weapons. Blood spattered everywhere, droplets flying through the air, mixing with dirt and coating me in sticky warmth. All I had to defend myself was a small, handmade sword. I didn't know which way to turn or how to get away, but I needed to. I needed to get out of there and get home, where it was safe. Why had I ever thought this would be glorious? There was nothing glorious about seeing men sliced open from throat to pelvis, their insides spilling out as they screamed in agony. There was no glory in watching a man choke to death on his own blood. In seeing men trampled to jelly under hooves and boots. I could hardly breathe for the panic and the smell of death all around me. I blinked and it was over. I was back on the rocks with my mother and Constantine, and the salty wind whipped my hair back. It could only have lasted a few seconds, but I could still smell the tang of blood. I looked down. The sword was still in my hand, the sword I had been holding in the vision. 
I know why you want this, I announced, looking up at Ivan. I understand now. His eyes narrowed as he studied me. You do. I saw everything, I said. Do you sometimes hold it and go back there? To that day. Why would I want to do that, he sneered, which turned into a laugh. You truly understand nothing, child. And we're wasting time. So if you'll excuse me, I'll take what belongs to me. One of his arms shot out, and the sword began shaking, fighting to leave my grasp. I focused all my energy on holding it, suddenly not wanting to give him what he wanted so easily. He wouldn't let us go. I knew that. I couldn't make it simple for him. There was no choice. I was strong, but he was infinitely stronger. I couldn't hold on anymore. The sword flew from my hand and into his outstretched one. When it made contact, the blade glowed brighter than ever. Ah. Old friend, the sorcerer crooned the way one lover would croon to another. Constantine took advantage of his distraction and used his speed to fly to his side, but Ivan was quicker. He waved the sword in his direction and sent Constantine flying back, hitting the stony ground with an audible crack. No. I cried out, lunging toward him, then stopped myself. My mother's warning rang in my head. It was too late. Ah. I see. You care for that monster, do you? The sorcerer's laugh was like nails running down a chalkboard, screeching through my brain, making me grind my teeth. Not just the sound, but the hatred behind it. He hated us all. Take what you came for and get out of here, my mother commanded, sounding every inch the high sorceress she was. She held her hands in front of her. Now before you regret deciding to stay. He regarded her. I believe you mean that, he finally murmured, nodding slowly. Which is why I need to do this. Suddenly, my feet left the ground. So did my mother's. We hovered ten feet in the air, arms and legs bound by invisible restraints. That was when the change began. Chapter 14 Monica I watched, stunned, as light moved from the sword's blade up to the hilt, then through Ivan's hand and up his arm until it covered his entire body. Gone was the white hair, the wrinkled skin, the pale watery eyes. His body filled out, the arms thickened and the legs, as he lost his slight stoop and straightened up. His hair turned rich and black, thick wavy. His deep blue eyes crinkled slightly at the corners, as his full mouth curved into a smile. Just like that, he had gone from a withered bag of bones to a young, vital man in the prime of his life. If I hadn't known better, I would have guessed him to be somewhere around thirty years old. That's so much better, he said, still smiling. You have no idea how dreadful it is to live in an old body. Old and creaking and tired. Always tired. If I ever reached that condition and had no way out, I would kill myself rather than suffer through it. You could do that now? Constantine growled menacingly on his feet again. Ivan only laughed. Now that I'm back in fighting shape? Just as young and energetic as I was over five hundred years ago when I first used this thing. He moved the sword through the air, making it swish and sweep. The blade caught the light and made it shimmer so bright I had to bring my hand up to my eyes to shield them. No. Life is too good to let it go, my countrymen. You ought to know that by now. Constantine snarled. I don't know it. I would gladly let go of this prison sentence. The sorcerer frowned. What? And run the risk of meeting up with your family in the afterlife? If you believe in that sort of thing, I mean? I turned my head as far as I could to look at Constantine, and what I saw brought tears to my eyes. I didn't know so much pain could exist in a living creature. His face contorted. You have no business talking about them, he warned. Why not? Because I'm not the one who murdered them? His smile was sickeningly sweet and completely for show. Would you like the honor of telling your lady love exactly what brought it on? I'm sure she would enjoy hearing all about it, unless you think her love is fickle, and that she, like any other rational creature, would cast you aside when she finds out how truly vicious and brutal you can be. Constantine, you don't owe me anything, I called out, straining my voice to be heard over the roaring wind and crashing sea. Afraid to hear it, are you? Ivan taunted. 
Enough of you. I screamed. You're nothing. You're pathetic. You hold on to life like a greedy child who won't let go of his favorite toy, long after the toy has outlived its usefulness. What's the point of living when all you do is sit in your castle, alone, with no one to care for you, and nothing but trinkets to keep you company? You know nothing, he hissed. I think I do, I shouted back. You were afraid to die. You saw men fall around you, and you knew your time would come, and you did the only thing you could think to do. Stop this, he warned, his voice raising in pitch. But there was no stopping me. I had found a weakness, and I would do everything I could to exploit it. You were just a scared boy, fighting a grown man's battle. You were terrified. Probably pissing your pants. Men were bleeding, screaming, vomiting blood and you had to find a way out, alive. And you used your magic, even though you knew it could get you killed anyway, if anybody noticed what you were doing. You enchanted the sword, and used it to cut your way out of the throng. You might even have killed some of the men on your own side, but you didn't care so long as you survived. Isn't that right? Tell me if I'm wrong. The muscles in his jaw jumped and twitched as his eyes narrowed. You're a clever little witch, aren't you? Not half as clever as you think you are, I spat back. You've spent five hundred years honing your power, putting more and more of it into that sword. The sword that saved your life. Only now it's become your life, hasn't it? You can't survive without it. You've only lived a half-life all this time, because so much of you is inside of that thing. That silly stupid useless sword. Useless? I'll show you how useless it is. He leveled it at me, but suddenly aimed at my mother. She screamed. Her head snapped back, eyes wide and staring as he tortured her. Had enough, he asked, but his eyes were on me. He was talking to me. Yes? I shrieked. Let her alone. He shrugged, then lowered the sword. She slumped over but remained standing, still suspended as I was. Maybe next time you'll hold your tongue, he snapped. You might not care about your life, but I know you care about hers. Why don't we settle this once and for all? Constantine called out. You and me. Leave them out of it. I would love to. You have no idea how much I would. But it doesn't work that way, Ivan replied. You see, you're not the one who purchased the sword. This had nothing to do with you. I'm her night warden, Constantine snarled. Yes, yes, I'm sure you are, and I'm sure that means something, but not to me. To me, she's the one who took what was mine. She's the one who deserves ultimate punishment for this. She didn't know it was yours. She should have known it was somebody's. Something like this doesn't find its way to a peddler's cart by sheer accident. If she's half the witch she thinks she is, she would have felt its power and known it was nothing for her to trifle with. I didn't know, I said, even though I knew it didn't mean anything. He didn't care. All he wanted was revenge. And Constantine couldn't save me from that. If I were you, I would say my goodbyes now. Ivan leveled the sword at me. There was an evil gleam in his eyes. No. Constantine lunged. It all happened at once. A bolt of bright white light leapt from the tip of the blade and sailed through the air coming at me. My mother's screams pierced my ears. I closed my eyes and wished she didn't have to see what was about to happen. I wished I'd had the nerve to tell Constantine she was right. I did love him. He would never know. I was ready to give up my life. Mother's scream turned into a shriek. The bolt never touched me. I waited for it, wondering why it hadn't hit yet. I dared open my eyes. And I saw why I was still alive. Constantine. I screamed when I saw him lying there, flat on his back beneath where I hovered. He had taken the bolt for me. His eyes were wide open, staring up at the sky. Seeing nothing. I screamed until my throat was hoarse, until my voice broke and all that came out was raspy screeching. I would never stop screaming. My life was over. He had died for me. It was pointless because without him, I had no life. There was no living. If Ivan had a shred of pity in what was left of his heart, he would kill me too. 
nothing could be worse than living without Constantine. And he knew it too. My my my. I must admit even I hadn't foreseen that, he chuckled, shaking his head when I looked up at him through eyes filled with tears. I knew he wanted you, anyone could feel it, but the fact that he was willing to throw himself in front of you like that? I underestimated his speed, as well. I suppose there's still room for surprises even when one reaches my age. You twisted monster, my mother wept. Constantine was hers long before he was mine. Her grief was enormous, pulling heart-wrenching sobs from her. You cared nothing for him, so don't pretend otherwise, the sorcerer sneered. Our kind has little concern for theirs, and you know it. Constantine. Constantine. I kept watching, waiting, hoping. He couldn't be dead. It wasn't possible. He was a vampire, not much could kill him. I had no idea what had come out of the sword though, and I couldn't forget that. There was no telling what had happened to him. Tears dripped from the tip of my nose and landed on his chest. This is much better than what I originally had in mind, Ivan sneered. I was going to kill you, but he helped me work out a much better punishment. Now, you have to live with the knowledge that he died for you. I love you, I whispered, trying my best to ignore the sorcerer's ugly words. All I wanted to remember just then was the few sweet hours I had spent in Constantine's arms, loving him without knowing I was. I would never feel that sort of peace and comfort and safety again. I was sure of it. Why didn't I tell him when I had the chance? Now, if you'll excuse me, I must be moving on. Oh, before I forget. My mother and I floated to the ground. The moment my feet touched stone, I fell to my knees at Constantine's side and took his face in my hands. It was so cold. Hard as stone. My mother wrapped her arms around my shoulders and wept against my neck. Constantine's unseeing eyes stared up at me. And blinked. I was sure I had imagined it. Until he blinked again. My mouth fell open, and a cry of joy threatened to burst from my chest. He shook his head ever so slightly. He wanted the sorcerer to think he was dead. I turned my face toward my mother's, burying it in her neck. He's alive, I whispered in her ear. Don't react. He's alive. She raised her head slightly, turning her eyes toward him, and her arms tightened around me until I almost yelped. Count of three, we take it from him, she murmured. I nodded. What did you say? Ivan called out. One, two, three. We moved in unison throwing our arms straight out, concentrating our power on the sword. He screamed as it flew from his hand and skittered across the rocks, he watched it, then his head swiveled back in time to see Constantine flying at him, claws extended. He tried to throw his arms up in time to throw a spell, but he was too slow. Probably out of practice, used to the sword doing the work for him. Constantine leaped onto him, pulling his head to the side with one sharp jerk before tearing his throat out and shoving him to the ground. Ivan's body writhed while his blood jetted into the air, glowing bright red even against a dark sky. Magic blood. Dark magic. Constantine stepped away from it as if by instinct. Do you see? My mother whispered, clutching me to her. I nodded. I saw everything. The way his body went back to its old form, withered and stooped. Then older. And older still. Centuries old. His face caved in on itself, his hands turned to nothing but bones before dissolving into dust. Within seconds dust was all he was. The wind picked him up and carried him away. Constantine was still breathing hard, heavy, staring down at the place where the sorcerer's body had fallen. He looked up at me. Constantine. I wept, running to him and throwing my arms around his neck. Don't ever do anything like that to me again. Like what, he asked as his arms circled my waist. Like pretending you were dead. I was laughing and crying all at once as I tried to process what just happened. All that mattered was he was alive and we were together and there was no more danger. Until he pulled back, holding me at arm's length. His face was smooth, unreadable. Monica, I wasn't pretending. I did die. Chapter 15 Constantine
Monica reeled. You what? she whispered. Died. Marissa joined us. You're sure? You weren't just stunned or something? No. I'm sure of it. I died. And I came back. I tried to read Monica's feelings, but they were too wild and conflicting to make sense of. How is it possible? she breathed. I don't know. It wasn't a conscious decision. I was dead, then I wasn't. I jumped in front of you, and the bolt hit me, and just like that, it was over. I knew it was over. I felt my body die, one second of agony, like my insides burst into flames, and it was over. I went away. But then, you were holding my face in your hands, and I saw you. I was back. I know it sounds crazy, I added, looking at Marissa. But it's true. She shook her head. I don't understand. The back door to the shack swung open. I'm sure you could make sense of it if you gave it a little thought, Marissa. The three of us turned in the direction of the voice. Monica and Marissa gasped at the sight of three tall, imperious witches standing in the doorway. They were each beautiful, and each anywhere from 25 to 250 years old. There was no way of telling, though I would have bet they were older rather than younger. Esme. Serena. Maeve. What are you doing here? Marissa sounded shaken up. Who were they? The High Council, Monica muttered under her breath. I understood the apprehension. I had come back to life, and for what? For them to order my death? I looked down at her and tried to smile. I suppose I have to accept what's coming to me, I murmured, tucking a strand of hair behind her ear. Just know that I love you, no matter what happens. I love you. Please don't let them take you from me. Not when I just got you back. I kissed her forehead and looked around. The wind had died when Ivan died, and the environment had become calm and tranquil. Even the ocean had settled to its usual strength. I turned to take one more look at it, before the inevitable occurred. What brings you here? Marissa acts. I turned back to see her walking to them with her hands outstretched. She took each of their hands in hers and bent, touching her forehead to them in turn. Monica did the same. The three of them looked at me. We came for him, the witch in the center announced. Long white blonde hair flowed down her back and over her shoulders to the waist of her deep blue robes. All three of them wore robes of that color, I noticed. Funny the things you notice when you're about to die. Again. Why him, Serena? Monica tried to position herself between us. He's done nothing wrong. He broke our laws, the dark-skinned witch on the right announced. Her eyes were like burning embers, and they glowed as she stared at me. I returned her stare. I wouldn't back down. Esme, please. All of you, you must understand. Marissa shot me a look of despair. He had no idea of what I was doing. He's not at fault. It was all my responsibility, and I'll take the punishment for it. I only wanted to. We know what you wanted to do, announced the third witch, who I assumed was Maeve. She pushed back her flaming red hair and settled her hands on her hips. We're aware of everything that's happened here, and leading up to this night. The disturbance the three of you caused tonight, for counting the sorcerer, was impossible to ignore, Esme explained. We understand the circumstances and what brought all of you here. It is our duty, after all. Of course, of course. Marissa's voice cracked. I sensed her panic and her determination to keep me alive. I had never respected her quite so much, even if it was her fault we came to such an end. Marissa continued, I don't have to explain it to you, but all the more reason for you to understand the situation and why things happened as they did. He was not at fault. He's never done anything but serve me well. Except for one thing. Serena came to me, gliding gracefully, looking like she floated above the rocks. I wouldn't be surprised if she really did float. You fed from Monica after you were aware of the change. Isn't that so? No use denying it when she knew the truth. Yes. I did. 
this evening. He had to. He needed his strength. Monica cried out. Serena held up a hand, but never broke eye contact. Her eyes were almost as silver as her hair. They seemed to probe me, searching my thoughts, prying out the truth. You did it when you knew it was against our laws. We could almost excuse your behavior up to this point, since you were not aware of the switch, but the conscious decision to feed from a witch other than the one you were sworn to protect. I understand, I murmured. So, you realize there's no real excuse for this. You weren't in your final moments dying of thirst. That's correct? Her eyes narrowed a bit. You won't try to defend yourself. There's no defense. You've already made that clear. The decision is yours. I wanted to look at Monica, tell her how sorry I was, explain that I was taking the punishment in the hopes that she wouldn't have to. Anything to ease her suffering. I had already put her through enough. I didn't want to break eye contact with Serena, however. She blinked. The corners of her thin mouth quirked up into what looked like it could be a smile, if she tried a little harder. Very well. I appreciate your honesty, as I'm sure the council does. You're free to go. He's what? Marissa gasped. Serena looked back. I said he's free to go. Just like that. Monica acts, almost smiling in disbelief. Just like that. Serena turned back to me. Because of what you did here tonight. What I did. You sacrificed your life for Monica, Maeve explained. She was moments from death, and you nobly threw yourself in front of her to protect her. It wasn't duty which made you do it, Esme smiled. It was love. And that should never be punished. You paid the ultimate price. Serena took my hands in her long, lean, powerful ones. I could almost feel that power pulsing into me. We saw, and we stepped in. Stepped in. Her words became clear. You brought me back. She nodded. We brought you back. Maeve walked to where the sword had come to rest. It looked like any ordinary weapon, and much older than it had before. The metal was rusted, the handle was cracked and splintered. Ivan's power was gone and so was the enchantment placed on his weapon. Rest assured, this will be destroyed, Maeve grimaced as she examined it. Good. I hope I never see another sword, Monica murmured, rubbing her arms. What about Marissa? I asked Serena in a low voice. Her eyes shifted in Marissa's direction, then back to me. I think she's suffered enough. She watched her daughter nearly die and she felt genuine anguish when you passed into the next realm. She's learned her lesson. I'm glad I smiled. She stepped back to join her sister witches. When we said you're free, we meant it in every way, she added. Every way. The three of them nodded in unison. We're releasing you from your duties as Night Warden. You're free now to live as you wish. When Serena smiled, her face was radiant. Do not waste this opportunity. I won't. It was almost too good to be true. Free. Still a vampire, but free to do as I wished. She looked at Monica. And neither should you, she advised. I promise I won't. Esme looked at Marissa. Tomorrow, we'll go about the process of securing a new Night Warden for you, and we'll contact you for the ritual of awakening back at the fold. We trust your new one won't be deceived as this one was. Marissa winced but replied, You have my word. That seemed to be enough for them. They stepped back into the shack and closed the door without a word. When Marissa opened it, the room was empty again. I can't believe it. I can't. That's it. It's over? Monica looked at me, halfway between a laugh and a sob. I swept her up in my arms. It's over. Everything's over, except this. I wrapped my fingers around the back of her neck and pulled her in for a deep kiss, sweeter than anything I had ever tasted. Her tears dampened my cheeks. Chapter 16 Constantine Can I ask you something? I slid an arm under my head and looked down at her. 
Of course. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. Oh. This doesn't sound good. She sat up, drawing a sheet around her. No, no, believe me. I'm only curious. I could still see her face in the dark bedroom. She looked sincere. All right. What is it? Her voice dropped to a whisper. What was it like to die? After, I mean? What happened? Not an easy question to answer. You don't have to. Truly. I looked up at the ceiling with a sigh. I want to. I've wanted to since we were back at Little House. Now I feel that there's no reason not to. All right, she trailed off waiting expectantly. A deep breath. Then I saw my family. She let out a sigh of happiness. You did? Your parents, your sisters. Yes. They were there. Waiting for me. If I closed my eyes, I could still see them. They were still young, all of them, just the way they were when I last saw them around the table in our little cottage in the woods. What happened? She asked in a hushed, awed voice. He wanted me to tell you back there. On the rocks, when he had you restrained. Remember? He said something about me being afraid of seeing my family on the other side. Yes. And you don't ever ever have to tell me why he said it. I don't know how he knew. Maybe the sword gave him second sight, or maybe he remembered hearing stories back then when it happened. I still stared up at the ceiling, but it faded away and became the inside of the cottage. Mama and father, the girls. I miss them so much. I missed everything about my human life. It took a long time for me to adjust to being who I was, I suppose it does for all of us, really. I had never aspired to become a monster. One night, not long after I turned, I went home and watched from afar. I told myself not to go near. I didn't want to frighten them, as they thought I was dead for good. But I couldn't help myself. I wanted to hear their conversation. I wanted to smell their food and feel the warmth of the fire in the hearth. Oh, Constantine. I don't remember which of them saw me first. I only remember their screams. Father cursed me, told me I was a devil, to get away from him and his family. His family. I was his family. I tried to explain it to him, but he would have none of it. Mama, she screamed and shrieked and tore at her clothes. I might have driven her insane. I choked up at the memory. It was all so clear when I allowed it to be. I killed him first. My father. He was the biggest threat. Then, Mama. And the girls. I killed all of them. And at the time, in the moment, I didn't even care. I wanted to. Their hearts were beating so fast, and I could smell their blood so clearly. I lost my senses, and the bloodlust came over me, and I couldn't control it then, being as young and unpracticed as I was. Besides, I was glad when the screaming stopped, when they stopped calling me a monster, a demon, something out of hell. It wasn't until the lust calmed, and I came back to my senses, that I understood what I had done. I could still taste their blood on my lips. It was all over me, as though I had painted myself in it. I'll never forget that feeling. Wishing I were dead too. I fell silent, and Monica didn't speak for a long time. I could just imagine what she was thinking. I felt her confusion, her pity. I didn't want her to pity me, but I didn't dare tell her not to. I had already pushed her away by telling her. Ivan was right. She couldn't love me after knowing that. Instead of cursing me or leaving me lying in her bed alone, she asks, what happened when you saw them? On the other side. I let out a shaky breath, almost smiling in spite of my grief. They welcomed me. They said they'd been waiting for me. And they forgave me. I remembered the warmth and love which had wrapped itself around me, knowing what they said was true. They really did understand and welcomed me with open hearts. Monica's sniffles brought me back to the present. You have to forgive yourself, she whispered as tears rolled down her cheeks. They forgive you. You can too. It's not that easy. Sure it is. 
You've carried this with you for long enough. Set it down now. Let it go. Move on. You have a second chance. You're free. We can be together for as long as you want. Was she right? Was it that easy? Guilt was a habit formed over the centuries. How could I let go of it that quickly? Like it was a bag I had been carrying. I had told myself it was all right, that I had been given a gift when I died. I could move on fully, knowing my family loved me and would be there one day when it was really my time. How does forever sound? I whispered, reaching for her. I like forever and a day better, she agreed, melting into my arms, letting me lay her down and love her until the sun came up. Epilogue Monica I never thought I would see this place again. Constantine took my hand to help me over some rocks on our way down the hillside. I still know it by heart. It hasn't changed. Not very much, he said. There are some new clearings, and I didn't recognize the town we just passed through on our way here. That must be a new addition. New addition? I snorted. It could be nearly a century old. And it looked that way too, with its narrow streets and stone buildings with doorways so short he had to duck to make it through. It was cozy, quaint, like something out of a storybook. And old. Very old. Which is new to me, he retorted. But the trees and rocks are here. He pointed. Out there is the stream where I used to catch fish. I would check the lines twice a day for new catches and take them home for Mama to cook up or to cure for winter. I had never seen him look so happy as he did while explaining his home to me. His face shone even when he wasn't smiling, when he was it was like the sun. He seemed more vital than ever more real, more comfortable in his skin as he ran his hand over the trunk of a very large, very ancient tree. They rose like skyscrapers all around us and were full of twittering birds. It was enchanting. I almost expected Snow White to come dancing out of a little cottage, accompanied by seven little men and a bunch of helpful animals. We must be close. He looked back and forth, gauging our distance from the stream. That trio of boulders is where I used to set my lines, so we can't be more than a mile from where the cottage used to sit. He took my hand and led the way, sharing all the old memories that came up with every new discovery. I had to remind myself more than once to pay attention to my footing instead of to him, but watching him was so much fun. He became animated, light-hearted, and made me wonder about the young man he used to be. It sounded like he worked hard for his family making sure they had enough to eat while his father sold what he caught for money. I wondered what life would have looked like for him if he had lived it. He probably would have settled down with some local girl. I was sure they fell all over him, handsome as he was, though he denied it. He was too busy making sure the family was taken care of, to consider leaving them, he said. I doubted the little home they'd shared still existed, but I didn't want to tell him that and burst his bubble. Better he found out on his own. A. N. D. It wasn't the cottage we stumbled upon first. It was the graves. My goodness, I whispered, one hand over my chest. Four wooden planks, barely visible over the grass. He stood there, staring, while I bent to clear away the weeds and overgrowth. There was no discernible writing on them, but I didn't know if such a thing existed back then, and thought it better not to axe. Here they are, he said. They're not really here. You know that. You saw them. I slid my arms around his waist and rested my head on his chest. I know. Still, it does me good to see where they rested. He looked up and around. I suppose the cottage was here then. It was gone, though I doubted it had been removed. More like time and the elements had destroyed it. I watched him walk over the ground occasionally stopping to bend down and examine something. Look. An old spoon. He handed it to me, and I turned it in my hands with a sense of reverence and awe. His family had used it. Maybe he had, himself. We found a lot of little treasures like that, which I carefully stashed in my backpack. Something for him to have to remind him of the love in the past, instead of the bad memories which still sometimes haunted him. 
It had been almost a year since he first told me the story of their deaths, but I still felt his guilt and self-loathing. It was my idea to visit Serbia, to take him back to the start in the hopes of bringing him around. I did love living here, he said, wiping his hands on his jeans as he stood. Smell how fresh the air is. It is very fresh, I agreed, taking a deep breath. And it's a beautiful place. It was then too, he smiled. We can come back here any time you want, I reminded him. Sincerely. And we can stay as long as you like. For the rest of our lives, even. You would leave the coven, he asked, one eyebrow raised. I shrugged. They're important to me, of course, but you're more important. This is our life now, not just mine. I want you to be happy. Happy. He took a deep breath, let it out slowly. I think focusing on happiness is a modern trend. We never thought about it back then. It's not easy for me to think about it now. I was happy, but it wasn't as if I strove for happiness. I only did what I had to do, and was lucky enough to have a family I loved. So you're saying it doesn't matter what happens now? You don't need to be happy? He came to me with a smile and kissed me tenderly. I never said I wasn't happy. You're my happiness. So it looks different to me now than it did back then. A lot looks different than it did back then. He pulled me to him and held me, stroking my hair. You made this happen, and I'll never be able to thank you enough for bringing me back. You're the one who earned your freedom by saving my life. I figured I owed you one. He pulled back smiling. You think you haven't saved my life? You save it every day. Just by being you. Really? It was the sweetest thing he could have said, and my heart glowed with relief and joy that I could make that sort of a difference to him. Really truly. He kissed the tip of my nose, then my upturned mouth. Do you want a minute alone with them? I asked when the kiss ended, glancing in the direction of the graves. He looked their way, and a million thoughts moved across his face. Guilt that would always be there in the background, even it shrank a little as time went on. Sadness. They had missed out on so much in life, especially his sisters. Relief that he had found them, and might be able to close the door on that part of his history for once and for all. They'd always have a place in his heart, but he had something else to move on to. Somebody else to move on to it with. I think we've said all we need to say to each other, he murmured. I told them I was sorry when I had the chance, and they told me they understood and forgave. I know they've rested well. That's all I need. He looked down at me. You're all I need. Let's keep it that way, shall we? I tightened my grip around his waist. Forever at least. I hope you've enjoyed this Ava Benton book. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.